This is exactly right. To my favorite murder. Uh, this week's episode will focus mostly on <laughs> the positive. <laughs> Why? Really? What? You didn't tell me that was the rule. <laughs> we did not have a meeting about this before. I hate it. <laughs> I think it's the worst. Mm-hmm. We're off to a great start. Here we go. That's Karen Kilkara. That's Georgia Hardstark. The, the positivist, positive person in Positville. I am the positivist. <laughs> And always have been. I'm a positive activist. Oh, a pactivist? A positivist. <laughs> a pause activist. Yes. Um, Great. What do you do? Do you like mostly march or? I take a nap because there's no way to be positive when right. you're conscious. You so know, you just, conscience. right. Conscious. Conscience. Conscious. Conscious. So my conscience goes shuts away. Shuts down. <laughs> Escapes from this hideous reality. And then it's just neutral, Bill. Nice. That's great. How I, are you? I like to make signs. Like sign language or like gang signs? Uh, no, just, oh. you know, I glue a piece of paper on a piece of wood mm-hmm. and then it'll say a positive activism. I bet it's, is it a funny pun? You know, I love puns. <laughs> so usually I will go with a pun first. Good. So it's like eggs. Excuse me. Right. What, what like is eggs? A pun? <laughs> Always egg based. Don't pun. touch my. Uh, yeah. Lego my ego. Lego my egg. That would actually be funny. <laughs> For like a Planned Parenthood. <laughs> Pro pan, Planned Parenthood. But the waffles are breast shaped. I love it. Sunny featured. side up eggs yes. on it. Yeah. Oh my God. Lego my eggs. Oh. Oh no. Lego my. Oh no. Is it. We're spitballing. 20, 2019 and we still don't have rights. What? Is it 2019 and we still don't know how to intro a podcast? (laughs) I feel personally, like now I resist logic when Mm. we do this. Mm -hmm. I resist ever having it be clean and clear. I want to drive new listeners away. This isn't this isn't the podcast uh, the dropout. This isn't the dropout. <laughs> this isn't NPR. This isn't fucking the podcast of news time. Yeah, because and you know why? It's because you don't hear light typing in the background, <laughs> which is how you know you're on NPR. We have no music budget. No, we have no s- journalism skills to speak of. I feel like Stephen would be happy to bust out that keyboard and play some more sure. of his electronica, some tones in the background. Yeah, his uh, what is is it called thrash garage <laughs> what's steven's brand of music it. it's mustache thrash must, must threat no that sounds like a that sounds like a mold problem a bacteria problem it is He's got mustache thrash oh have you heard about steven's Steven thrash coming to work head to toe thrash <laughs> but it's heaviest on his mustache he turned his mustache red um guys we're back in the studio yeah that's right we're in the midst of our fucking insane winter fall tour we're having so much fun Ooh, it's the fucking best i think our next one is in vegas yes which is really exciting marty is gonna be there for some reason my dad wants to come my sister and adrian are coming oh like i think everybody wants to come sure it's vegas it's fucking vegas baby buffalo <laughs> everyone's gonna be playing those buffalo machines georgia's already talked about what buffalo sh- machine she would like to Dude. have reserved for her double down can you do that? Double down on a machine. I'm doing. I'm going to be yes. the one who sits between two machines and I'm playing it, both it, of them. Give your money away. Chain smoking. Just make sure you always feel lucky. <laughs> Let's see. What my, What is my game? Wheel of Fortune? No. Oh, best. Willy Wonka. That's my game. Okay. I like Wheel of Fortune too. Wheel of Fortune is a classic. Anything that you can win a spin on a game thing? Yes. Great. And it's... um. Anything where you, it feels like you're uh, actually interplaying with the machine, right. even though that thing's spinning and whatever sure, comes like, up is going to You don't know up. where it's going to stop on the, yes, you do. And you're like, bing, bing, bing. Yeah, you're stupid. Yeah. Give us, get, get all, get rid of all your money. <laughs> Give us your money. That's why you, yeah, it's going to be fine, everyone. Yeah. Uh, ultimately and in, in later on, it's going to be fine. Sure. You're going to learn a lesson. Oh, in the meantime, gamble your money get away. Get drunk and gamble. <laughs> <laughs> Get as many free drinks as you can on the floor. Marty, what's Marty going to do in Vegas? Oh, I don't know. Maybe camp outside. Oh, I, uh, I took uh, three 20s out of the bank and I will, <laughs> he'll use them throughout the night. He's going to camp in the garage. There's a nice uh, bathroom where you can take a shower. Does Marty smoke a cigar? It, like it's cel- celebratorily? Does he drink? How does Marty? Marty will have a drink Party. once in a while. Uh, you know, a drink once in a while. Oh, <laughs> we did. 
So the night before we left for this last weekend tour and he was going to stay the weekend and watch the cats so he came over the night before because dads can't drive at certain hours right that's right that That, yeah so he was supposed to you know we were leaving is he night blind he's blind blind. no he just he's colorblind okay he's just they just he's very ocd like literally and uh, what's figuratively literally (laughs) yeah um and so whatever he just came over early and we got drunk together oh nice that's the end of the story (laughs) we just drank a bunch of rose and yelled about israel and watched a vietnam documentary by ken burns which i highly recommend we just haven't kept keep pausing it to yell about shit and then we'd watch it again yeah and vince was just watching us being like oh no (laughs) what did i marry into (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it was great. Uh, so that's how Marty Party is a documentary. <laughs> a little vino. Some nice rosé. Yeah. I like it. That's right. Oh, I have a correction. Get, let's hear it. It's more of a, yeah, it's a correction from a couple weeks ago. I just want to make everyone know that the ta-da list that I talked about, instead of making a to-do list or including a to-do list, you should make a ta-da list of positive things that have, you know, just so you have it, not just like things I need to do, but like things I've fucking accomplished. Fuck sure. you. An accomplishment list. Yeah, like an angry accomplishment list. Yeah, a fuck you accomplishment a list. fuck you to your to-do list. <laughs> yeah. Is essentially what it is. Always. Um, and I wanted to say that it's, it was created by Gretchen Rubin, who's this incredible um, author. She wrote The Happiness project we all mm. heard of it and the four tendencies lizzie cooperman loves her she also <laughs> has a podcast called happier which i now need to listen to but oh, that cool. was her idea and i couldn't i maybe said it was gail Yo. but it wasn't oh gail from gail and oprah yeah oh <laughs> but it wasn't maybe it was oh you're just sourcing yeah i, I just it. want to make sure that i give her credit so that's who that the ta-da list the ta-da list was written by gretchen Ruben. Ruben. Yes. Awesome. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen, for your great ideas. Yeah. Um, Because that is a really smart way to flip that around. Because it it is like, I I have so many to-do lists around my house. Yeah. And I never do any of the things on them. And then I get, then I, when I do do things on them, I, then I'm like, oh, I'm not crossing that off. Yeah. Like it's not all the way. Yeah. I'll do like, I'll have a shitty thing that's like, make an appointment and then go get this thing. And it's like, well, I made the appointment. Yeah. I don't really want to go get the thing. (laughs) It all gets really depressing. Oh, why is life hard? So instead of that negative being a a ten attenuated yes. i don't even know what that word means here we go Stephen, could you t- please look up what attenuated means? you just made it up i, I think i don't know but instead of being acclimated that's probably not there it, it either. is too um, <laughs> it has to start with an a and instead be really of long, being uh aligned with negativity docile or or just being negative oh it does mean something uh attenuated having been reduced in force effect or value in a sentence it appears likely that no. the courts will be given an attenuated role that's oh, right. Enforcement of these decisions. That's it. It's totally incorrect. It's correct. It's not. <laughs> oh, are you trying to be positive? I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say uh, corrections corner and heard from a lot of Scots about this one. I, in talking about headbutts. Guys named Scott are just um, texting you now? Luckily, no. <laughs> um, just. Uh, Scottish people oh, letting it. letting me know that my little riff because I couldn't think of the real nickname for headbutts, mm. so I called it a Belfast Good Morning and and just acted like that was the real name. But it actually what I was really thinking of and what everyone knew I was thinking of without me knowing it was it's called a Glasgow kiss. Oh, what's and a Belfast Good Morning? I made it up. Okay, because that's right. Because I a didn't know what the fuck you were talking about. <laughs> thought you made it up, and I was like, that was beautiful and incredible. Yeah, it's totally made up. Okay. All right. But I mean, I knew it was, I knew it was called something like that. That's, I like, listen, sorry, Scottish people. Listen. And people named Scott. Do, I like yours better. Be careful, careful. They will fucking headbutt okay, you Never. so quickly. <laughs> We're not, okay. Sorry. My favorite thing when I, I lived in Scotland for a short amount of time when I was on the television show, The Book Group, and my friend Michelle Gomez, who is from Glasgow, told me all about the kind of culture there. And one of my favorite things was, when on the weekends when people go out oftentimes women don't wear coats even though it's freezing fucking cold and they're wearing like a tube dress okay because they want to seem hard they want to seem tough so you don't wear a coat okay and that like 
is ex- such a great example of what Scottish people are like. What if I want to seem soft and tender and I wear six coats? <laughs> Just to make you it. will be beaten within an <laughs> inch of your life in, in Glasgow, Scotland. By a 12-year-old girl. It's just my favorite because the people party really hard there and they also are just like, and then you walk home in the cold oh. and you like keep on partying. Like you never, you never quit. So it's like your you, 20s all the time there. Yeah. Well, I think mostly when you're in your 20s though. Okay, great. <laughs> like, um, it wasn't like, the old people weren't really doing it. Okay. No. It wasn't like a lady in a tube, an old lady in a tube top. <laughs> no, it was all the youngs. Um, I want to give a shout out to the new animated mfm episode M- it's mfm underscore animated on instagram by nick terry yeah and it's on youtube as well he made a uh, animation <laughs> of the 400 year old shark conversation <laughs> that we had that is just so clever i want to punch uh people in the nick do you want to punch nick? i want to punch people named scott <laughs> bring him I back punch into scott's it. my friend patty riley um, texted me the other day because she had the Nick Terry shirt and yeah. she said that she, walking down the street she said she said when her arm was in a sling no one ever said a word to her but walking down the street with the Nick Terry sweatshirt people constantly <gasps> stopping her and saying oh my god are you a murderino and recognizing it what I love about him is that he so he's now selling uh, merch with his characters from from our conversations on it and he that messaged he has me put into yeah. the conversations but yeah. he messaged me and was like hey I just want to make sure this is okay. Like this, you know, it is still your thing and I just want your blessing. And if you're not okay with it, that's fine. Whatever the fuck. And I was like, Aww, make that fucking money. God bless. It's like, that's how you do it. And yes. we're like so happy for you. We, I should have said no and bought all the rights to it. <laughs> but that's just me being a merchandiser. That'd be a little aggressive. That's a little hard stark. Uh, um, me. Yeah, that that would have ruined the fun, yeah. I think. But I'm it, so happy for him. And I know and his, how much. Yeah. Well, he's just doing such good work. It's, I mean, it's incredible. He nails it every single time. It's hilarious. But I can't tell if that's because I'm in it. And so I just love it. <laughs> of course it is. <laughs> uh, of course it is. I, also, another person who's nailed it lately, it, truly my favorite, um, is Taft in the bathtub. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Someone named Adrian Kelt, I think, C-E-L-T, retweeted it and, it. and it was their drawing of Taft in the bathtub. President Taft in the bathtub from the Lincoln story you did in Washington, D.C. <laughs> I, I mean, I know. That's the, also the funniest thing is these things come up and you're like, yeah, when did I what, fucking say when that? When did we say anything? Remember when you said this no yeah but apparently what i said was ooh taft yeah <laughs> and then it was taft in the bathtub. it's a beautiful art yes. piece Please um also when we were in toronto you say toronto or toronto i say toronto toronto i think is correct right? okay well so this um gal came through the line with these perfectly packaged for the meet and greet these like packages wrapped in brown paper and fucking string and it was like adorable oh yes and she's like i made you guys dresses i'm a designer and we looked open them later and they're gorgeous and so last night i went to a fucking fancy hollywood movie and i wore it her name's sarah duke and it fit me so perfectly oh, yay. i felt like a ballerina from the waist down and then it was like slit in the back so my whole back was showing all Ooh. sexy you could turn it around but i have no cleavage so what's the point <laughs> It was just this gorgeous fucking dress that fit me perfectly. And like, I just want to buy everything from her. So her name on Instagram is Sarah and it's S-A-R-A, no H, Sarah, Sarah Duke. And she's a Canadian fucking clothing designer and she's incredible. Yeah, that's so awesome. I Like it's the perfect fit, everything about it. I love. And she really did. Go ahead. Sorry. No, no. It has pockets. Both (laughs) Both our dresses have pockets. She made sure to tell us that. I apologize. No, no. I was only going back over your thing because the the packages were b- wrapped. Gorgeous. The, it looked like it was from Victorian England. Yeah. Like it was black wrapping paper and then there was gold and then there was like little thread. See, I remember it as... Is it brown wrapping paper brown. with black? I could be 100% wrong. Well, the co- the color the color combo was black and brown. <laughs> it's very intense. Listen. Those, those nights. Don't more fight, Listen, look. Don't... Look. Um, there's a, I have a photo of my, not so fucking, I have a photo of myself up on my Instagram of me wearing it, but oh, I was good. too, cause it's a red carpet and I get, it's terrifying. And so I didn't put my hands in the pockets, which oh. I totally did in front of the mirror. That's what happens. You don't know where to put your hands. That's why we have pockets. That's right. And which I will then mention, God bless <clears throat> Broad Church's Olivia Coleman, mm. who won best actress, um, at the Oscars. Her dress had pockets. Amazing. And, uh, that was tweeted to us, um, that Mitchell and Webb look. Is that the show called? Uh, no, it's Peep Show was Peep what show. she was on. But same guys. Peep Show. She she's was on Peep so Show. She's so good in it. She was it's so good. It's so fun to see her win shit. She's it's, awesome. Because also she has been consistently killing it 
in England for yeah. like 20 yeah. years. And she's been on a ton of great shit. My, I first got to know her on Look Around You, which is one of my favorite things that's ever existed. I don't know it. You have to watch it. It's like a fake 70s in-studio, like um, PBS type of show. Amazing. But but it's everything's fake. So there's one where she introduces a thing that's a computer for women called the <laughs> Petticoat Vibe. <laughs> Sorry, there's a <laughs> it's a pink and white laptop oh, or it's a, a ladies computer. computer. And then there's when they <laughs> show like the keyboard, there's a nail file on, oh on the keyboard. God. You have to see the show. It's what's it called again? It's called Look Around You. Okay, maybe we can find it on YouTube. Uh, I'm not sure. The first season is all um, it's like 70s uh, tapes that they would put in at school when the teacher needed yeah. to go like. Smoke, smoke, a cigarette. In, smoke in the alley, basically. <laughs> but then the second season is this in studio where they have um, uh, Robert Popper and Olivia Coleman and uh, Peter Serafinowitz, and they all host it. But it's and it's taken very seriously. But everything is like I like the it. Petticoat Five. I love it. It's amazing. But we're I'm so proud of Olivia Coleman. Ugh. I'm so and it's the Get favorite it, is girl. the best movie. And she has pockets in her dress and she's just representing. Okay, but more so, not more so, but. Closer to home. And in addition to. And as well as. Scott, stop fucking trying to put words in our <laughs> Scott, mouth. Scott, don't actually me right now. Yeah. I'll say what this don't next. Don't Scott's blame me. <laughs> is. Um, our uh, friend of the uh, podcast, friend of the network, friend of the universe. Universe. That we live in. Uh-huh. Billy Jensen. Oh, yeah. Has his book coming out. Hell yeah. So you can pre-order it today. The book is called Chase Darkness With Me. Mm. I wrote the foreword. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> Air guitar. It's, it's about four paragraphs long. <laughs> um, but it is, I've read the book and it's What's it about? Great. Which one's it about? What's it about? It's basically about everything he's done. Like how into true crime he is and why. Yes. And where, how he got to start oh. and what it's from. And then also then these cases that he has come up against. And it's just, it gives you everything that a murderino would want in a book. It's really, really good. I mean, good. I still, I still, and I, I must have listened to it. 12 times through, listen to I'll Be Gone in the Dark while falling asleep at night, which is so twisted and fucked up, but that's just like the most comforting thing to me. Yes. Um, oh, and and she helped write or helped finish. That's right. Billy Jensen um, basically came in after Michelle McNamara died and helped Patton um, finish her book using all of her notes and all of her writing. Along with? Along with Paul Haynes. Right. Um, Amazing. Who was her researcher. So yeah, it's uh, it, now this is his book and please go uh, get it. it. You will be so happy that you did. I'm so excited. He looks he looks like a goth fucking anime character. <laughs> I don't that's nothing to do with anything, but it just make it helps. You know what's funny? In the foreword, I mentioned the first time we met him when he came up to us at um that restaurant next to the UCB on Franklin. Oh yeah. And he came up like just talking already. He was like, we're and friends and fu- here we go. Here we go. But with this journalist intensity where, where yeah. I was like, he's mad. Like we did something wrong. <laughs> and I was so nervous. To, to like when he started talking because I was like I don't know whatever date or time you're about to mention yeah I don't know what the yeah. correct one we is. don't we don't know facts you yeah no know that's that about us your yet. area yeah you get the facts right we treat your facts like gossip yeah. and talk about it um, um we have to give it speaking of gossip and talking about it yes. um we have to give a quick shout out not have to but want to because simply safe which we do ads for all the time and everything it's this is not like an overt ad this is us thanking them because we have this brand new office uh, we're going to be recording here all the time we're going to make it our fucking podcast home and a lot of other podcasts that we're eventually going to announce on our network exactly right and simply say fucking sent us a whole bundle of everything for fucking free just to to of security shit for the office yeah so we have a security system now for our office because of simply safe so we want to thank them yeah and thank them for being um a, a, like with our show yeah. for so long they've been advertising on the show for a long time i mean I, I honestly like those 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 ones that you've been hearing forever on those ads for podcasts i, I kind of like love them because like nobody fucking knows and no one believes in podcasts yes. except for these fucking companies that have been advertising with them for so long. It just Thank you, Casper. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know what I will say? And I don't know. This is really funny because I was really touched. I opened a box at my house the other day and I got a new Quip toothbrush. Oh, shit. Because remember I said I left my Quip toothbrush in D.C. Oh, my God. And I was like so touched. Like they heard Someone it and they listened. sent it. But then I remembered 
you're on automatic renewal oh, right. for those things. <laughs> <laughs> so Nobody I, listen. Nobody cares. <laughs> it's, either, it's either, and this is how it always is with me, either Quip is in love with me yeah. or Quip doesn't give a shit. Right. But I'm going to choose because it's the positivity they, train. Yeah. I'm going to choose that Quip loves me. Because this episode is all about um, positive sharding. Reinforcement. Oh. <laughs> sharding? What'd you say? Nothing. <laughs> I just didn't want to say thinking. Um, I refuse. Okay. Because there's no power behind it. It's This isn't the secret. Just do, don't be a dick and do good things. Yeah, that's right. And listen. There's there's no secret. There is no secret. Just don't do, be a fucking asshole. Yeah, or as my uh, hilarious comedian Bill Dwyer used to say, if it feels wrong, don't do it. <laughs> it's that simple. If, if you'd be mad that someone else did it to you, don't, don't do, do it, it to them. Don't do it. It's very simple. Now, here's what you can do. Okay. Uh, Mackenzie sent us a picture of her grandpa sleeping in his <laughs> onion field that I retweeted it. She had tweeted it and then she it's was like... It's on our Instagram. It's on our Instagram. Yeah, my favorite murder. I Instagram. think it went, it went across all oh, social media. I got tagged murder. in that more than I've been tagged in every, anything. About, and thank you. I love it. It's, it's the best. It's the best. And the second picture of her grandpa laying in the field is high art. It. I want someone to paint that. It is a gorgeous it's, thing. Yeah. It and is. it's an old man it's sleeping in his color. own. It's amazing in his own onion. As field. a champion napper, I still can't wrap my head around <laughs> how he did that. You're Why you up. pick a place to lay down and go to sleep in? I can tell you, as a farm person, I, I'll he call get, myself a farm girl. He got shit faced and passed <laughs> out. Could be that. That's always possible. But also, when you're kind of out in the middle of yeah. ev- anywhere and yeah. you have something to do and you're going to be doing it all day long, it's like repetitive work. Um. And you, you realize you can just kind of do whatever you want. No one's out there with you. You don't have to, you're not under the lash of society. The concept is foreign to me. It's, uh, and the earth is very warm when you lay on it often. As someone from literally from Southern California, except for a three year stint in San Francisco, Mm -hmm. open space and not being near people is, I don't even get it. I know. So. That's why we have, we have to go to like um, Montana. We have to go to like a Don't horse. Them that. Let's go to Therapy Horse Ranch. <laughs> <gasps> That'd be fun. Let's do I it. I want to meet a horse. I know they're the best. I want to meet an elephant. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, that sounded stupid. <laughs> it did. You were just taking. That. You were taking my idea and being like, but actually, you know what? On animals, I want to meet. <laughs> we're gonna meet huge animals. I just want to meet animals. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, and that got me really excited. I want to meet horses and elephants. Those are my two friends. Those are two good ones. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I support both of those. I. Yeah, I'm good with just horses. <laughs> And then going home and watching TV. I want to bathe an elephant. You know, you're not supposed to ride them anymore. Don't. That, uh, that yeah. makes sense. You're not. This is our new thing. There's like elephant ours. I don't know who the fuck I am. <laughs> this is our new thing. I don't know who I am. There's like elephant <laughs> sanctuaries in Thailand. And should I follow them on Instagram? And like the thing now is like they you don't ride elephants. That's like that's fucking cruel and shit. And now you just they let you bathe them. Oh, great. And they're in the fucking water. And they're like, yeah, bitch. Yes. Fucking bathe me. You bathe me for once. That's right. Sick as Spring I'll stuff on you. Stomp the shit out of you. <laughs> it's pretty great. I There's a, go that. on Instagram and find them. There's like, I love watching elephant videos. Yeah, that's the best. If I could have anything in my like ideal ele- elephant world, mm-hmm. it would be that like Aquaman, I could breathe underwater and then just look at fish all day. Cause that's oh. my blue planet two came out. Weird. We were talking about it the other night and it's so good. And it's so amazing, like, to be able to watch those animals so closely. Those motherfuckers. They're aliens. They're crazed. They're fucking aliens. Like, what is even happening? If you don't believe in aliens, put your face underwater. Get out of here, because... I mean, don't... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it won't help. (laughs) I mean, I don't mean kill yourself. I mean, go look at fish. (laughs) What do you get a... Would you ever get... Would you ever be a fish tank person? A fish tank person? Yeah. Like a big fucking saltwater built into the wall. That one, what's that TV show where they build fish tanks? I think it's, it's called a, fish. It's, it's tanked. A, it's called tank. <laughs> I swear to God. Oh, I believe you. It's the best. I was about to say, it's some terrible pun. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, real, real quick. Right yeah, here. Right. I would never uh, fish tank because mine would immediately have like the green mold on the glass. Well, this is why you hire someone to come take care of it. Yeah, okay, but then... Uh, what? Just so I can look yeah, at a thing? How yeah. about a poster? What about a great, one of those magic eye posters of three <laughs> dolphins coming out of the ocean? I'm going to get you, for your next birthday, an annual pass to some kind of aquarium. Great. 
Okay. I'll go there. Great. There is the, um, the aquarium that's, I think it's Long Beach. Long Beach has like the best one. There is a little fish there that has arms what? and it holds itself between rocks and it looks all like, like a punk. Like it's like this mean little fish that just sits in there and <laughs> I was like, Mimi. <laughs> for real. I looked at it for so long because it's like, basically evolving yeah it's this next level where your it's brain. like fins are now arms your brain was just like goodbye yeah sometimes i do that with seals and fucking pit bulls oh yeah it's yes. the same creature i think cats and seals are very similar huh i think you're wrong but i love you <laughs> what but about, i'm being positive but about I love it. You. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the whiskers fucking po- dogs have whiskers Am I wrong? Yes. Yeah, I'm <laughs> fucking right. You know I'm right. You know it. Um, I am drinking neat warm tequila. Yes, not you are. on purpose, but because this office is not equipped with anything yet. We're very bare bones here. That's I think right. it's cool. It's very like college. It feels college. It does. Um, it Slug. feels like we need to put the boys don't cry cure poster on yeah, one of these it's walls. It's very bright. If yeah. any lamp companies want to sponsor <laughs> us, any light bulb companies, any forgiving lamp companies, oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Like, and any ice cube companies. Yeah. Too. No. No, no fluorescent lights, like middle-aged lady lighting company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come at me. And ice cubes and mixers and mixers. Yeah. Hey, Sprite. Yeah. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Who's first? Um, I think it's you, right? Who was first? Oh no, you're first. Last night of Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Was so, Toronto? Yeah, Toronto. Was me? Yeah. Oh no, no. Was her? Okay, sorry. Yeah, first. Yeah, so Great, because this fucking tequila neat ain't gonna drink himself. <laughs> With America's number one meal kit, HelloFresh, you'll get easy seasonal recipes and pre-measured ingredients delivered right to your door. All you have to do is cook and enjoy. HelloFresh makes cooking delicious meals at home a reality. From step-by-step recipes to pre-measured ingredients, you'll have everything you need to get a wow-worthy dinner on the table in about 30 minutes. Say goodbye to endless grocery store trips and takeout. HelloFresh has you covered. There's something for everyone, from family recipes to calorie smart and vegetarian, and fun menu series like Hall of Fame and and Craft Burgers. HelloFresh has more five-star recipes than any other meal kit, so you'll know you're getting something incredible. HelloFresh is flexible, and it fits your lifestyle, easily change your delivery days, food preferences and skip a week whenever you need. Break out of your dinnerette and make deliciousness part of every week with HelloFresh. I love that even though HelloFresh is super easy and they make it really basic and like straightforward, you still feel like you're cooking this like incredible home cooked dinner and that makes me feel good about myself. And that instead of just ordering takeout, I'm actually making something and preparing something at home and that just, it feels good. So for $80 off your first month of HelloFresh, go to HelloFresh.com slash Murder80 and enter Murder80. It's like receiving eight meals for free only at HelloFresh.com slash Murder80, promo code Murder80. Go by. Did you find that fish I was talking about? Oh. Oh. Oh, you have to post him. Oh, yeah. So it's, uh, was it the axolotl? Is that, is it that thing? You don't know, but. (laughs) 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 There's a gif of one of those playing a keyboard. Holy shit. It's a keyboard fish. That's That's insane. That's hilarious. Can you please send me that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> put that on our Instagram. He'll put it on the Instagram tomorrow when we post our, uh, our visuals. The one I'm talking about is not so salamandery. It actually looks more like a fish, but it's really got a, it's got a bunch of bumps all over it. Huh? Oh, weird. I'll show creepy. It to you later. So creepy. It is very creepy. Can I start now? <laughs> oh, oops. positive positivity, positivity. Oh, can I start now? Sure. All right. So. My story is a bit, okay, this is a harsh one, but it's a bit of a corrections corner. Okay. Because at one time in our podcast life, I don't know when, we said that like, date skateboarders, they don't kill people. Oh. Do you remember saying that? I don't. I don't either. I bet I did. But we, not you, but one of us did. So (laughs) this is the fucking correction of that. Oh no. This is the murder of Jessica Bergston by Mark Gator Rogowski. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. I know. So I got a lot of info from this fucking documentary I saw a couple of years ago and was so affected by, had no idea about any of this called Stoked the Rise and Fall of Gator. And it's by this woman, Helen Stickler, um, who spent six fucking years making this documentary. Wow. Um, and also an article called Free Fallen by Corey Johnson that was originally in the Village Voice. So. To really understand the rise and fall of Gator, that's the skateboarder, I'm going to call him that now. Okay. um, You have to understand 
the skateboarding industry in the 1980s, which you and I maybe witnessed a little bit. Oh, I definitely did. California. But from a distance, nervously yeah. and breathlessly. Sure. Because all the boys that skated in my town, um, it seemed like they didn't have parents at all. They didn't. They could do whatever they wanted. They could. And they were so beautiful. They were gorgeous and beautiful and didn't give a shit about you. No. Nope. You were not part. And there were no, you know, women. It was like you, the girls were a side uh Piece. thing yeah the one time <laughs> i l- tried to learn how to skateboard in high school and i had a friend of mine try to teach me within two weeks i had fallen so hard and scratched my face up that i just quit <laughs> yeah it just wasn't for me no i my i have hips okay so um skateboarding in the 1980s and this is when gator was at the top of his career it uh so skateboarding in the early days wasn't a popular thing and no one was really doing it towards the end of the 70s um those who were skateboarding had started to skate vertical walls like in uh swimming pools that had been drained because of the 1976 california drought Mm -hmm. and um as we saw in dogtown and z boys which is also a fucking great documentary so They were doing that instead of the usual street skating that had been going on before. And they were also skating these uh, ramps that, you know, the ramps we know. And that's called vert skating. Okay. For vertical skating. That's what I call it. I didn't know. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't know that. That's what me and my Z-boys call it. (laughs) Oh, you and your Z-boyfriends. Yeah, yeah. So they had this less crazy control. They could skate faster and they could do these more dangerous aerial tricks and shit. Um, and since most people, you know, around the country couldn't build or afford these ramps and didn't have access to empty pools, there were very few people who were really fucking good at it because they could practice all the time. And that was people in California, especially Southern California and, and San Diego. Yeah. So those people got really fucking popular really fast because no one else was doing it. The other thing to remember that will put this that you need to remember while I'm telling you the story about Gator is that he is later diagnosed as severely bipolar. And that's not to say this has not, I'm telling you this from before when he commits this horrendous crime, but the, the amount of power and authority he has and the shit that goes to his head, you need to remember that that's based on him being, having being undiagnosed and untreated Mm -hmm. mentally ill. So, Da, 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 da. Okay, so while he's becoming rich and famous at a young age, um, his mental illness is unchecked in a lot of ways, it, which is actually really fucking helpful to his career. So let's go. Mark Rogowski is born August 10th, 1966 in Brooklyn, New York, moves to Escondido, California, which is a middle class suburb of northern fucking San Diego. At the age of three, after his parents' divorce, his dad fucking had rage issues and later dated and got the fuck out of there. Um, Mark, who went by Gator, started to skateboard at seven years old. Mm. He took it seriously, even as at a young age, and he couldn't afford the boards that everyone else had. So he made his own, which actually made him have a more unique style because he could do shit that other people couldn't do. Yeah. Um, a, skate park op- a skate park opened in Escondido, which is one of the first two skate parks in the nation to open. Um, and just after two years of skating in the park in 1978, he was picked up by a local skate team at just 12 years old. So th- I mean, it's insane. So by eight, by 1980 at 14, he's already sponsored by skate brands and making money from endorsement deals. From 14 a, years 14. old. That's not so good. So he never had to, you know, work on his education. He never had to be, you know, uh, told by his mom what to do. He never had to do any of that shit. He never learned the basic stuff where you and I are getting fucking made fun of and life sucks and you have to do what your parents tell you. Yeah. By from 12 years old on, he didn't have that. Yeah. I'm not fucking making excuses for him. He's fucking horrible and a total piece of shit but like but there's reasons yes yes it's this is a problem yeah um so he's already being paid between four and eight thousand dollars a month for clothing and skateboarding equipment endorsements um he is becoming famous immediately everyone loves him because he has a stupor stupor super aggressive skate style and these crazy aerial moves and he quickly becomes one of the biggest names in the sport in the sports wins a ton of awards personally he's charismatic and he's flamboyant and everyone loves his personality by 17 he's earning over a hundred grand annually Ugh. as a fucking 17 year old so exciting yeah he pays off his mom's house he buys himself a house and he's doing it with this thing that comes naturally to him that yeah. is like his it's basically his go to to get away from things being screwed up right and suddenly that's rewarding him right like that's that's kind of he's living the dream at such a young age totally like yeah. you shouldn't be allowed to <laughs> no one should allow to be Unless successful have, yeah some like guru that's right. right there going easy go like go do your chores right exactly um 
So he's performing around the globe. He's being flown to Japan just to sign autographs, not even to fucking skate. Like shit's bananas. Wow. Eventually he um, fucking, he punches a cop in the face at one point. So like he's just. In whole, Japan? No, Ugh. here in the States. Good. Not Japanese cops. Could you imagine? Um, and so of course he get, and that makes him even more famous. All the photos are in Thrasher and shit. Sure. He gets cocky and arrogant and just doesn't give a fuck. Um, and also, the, the reason I mentioned the issues with being bipolar is that uh, one, you know, some of the symptoms of that is, um, <laughs> oh God. Oh my God, are you okay? Sorry, I'm fine. What if Steven <laughs> died on <laughs> recorded? It's okay, take your time, take your time. I got really excited. <laughs> Sorry. I'm okay. I just, You're right. I just my you were red a minute ago, a second so ago. It's okay. So some of the the characteristics of being bipolar are things that ended up making him more famous and a better skater, like impulsivity. You know, uh, not a f- not a aware of hurting himself. He's he thinks he's superior. He yeah, all that shit. So it actually helped him, but it also made it so he didn't have to have it like taken care of yeah there's it's that thing it's you see a lot in stand-up comedy as well oh. where your person your deep personality flaws and oftentimes um because if you're an addict or right. uh, an alcoholic or something you have these personality flaws that actually completely serve you and benefit yeah. you and so you you spend a lot of time kind of misbehaving and getting rewarded for it wow it's very common wow i did it for so long <laughs> I was it's like, are we going to really are you hard? Go, okay. It's really hard oh, to that sucks. because you it's that it's basically like um, when there's a child that like learns to show off and everyone's like, yeah. isn't that I the best it. or whatever? But then it doesn't end. Yeah. Then that child is 38 and borrowing money from you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm picturing this 38 year old toddler borrowing money from me. And gosh, she's cute. Come on, just two thousand dollars. <laughs> what? Well, that's this is him. A hundred percent. Yeah. So by 1987, he's 21 years old and he's earning, he's earning $2 per skate deck from the company Vision, which is a new skateboarding company, which we all fucking know nowadays, but back then it had just started Mm -hmm. and they were like, let's fucking do this. And they loved him. So they're selling 7,000 of Gators decks with his specific logo on it. It's this like, it's almost like this Alfred Hitchcock, like vertigo, black and white spiral. Mm. Um, so they're selling almost 7,000 decks on a monthly basis. Back fucking then. Can I remind everyone there's no fucking internet? Yeah. Like there's nothing. This there's is Thrasher purely magazine. From, yeah, Thrasher magazine. That's it. Fill out this coupon. That's right. Um, so resulting in royalties totaling 14 grand a month for him. Nice. So he's making a fucking shit ton of money. Um, and back then, since there weren't a ton of pro skaters, it was easy for a company just to focus on one person and put everything into that person. And for Vision, that was Gator. And he blew up and so did fucking Vision uh, skatewear. So then, of course, after the magazines come out, they start making skate videos, which I remember watching once in a while. My yeah. brother was not into skating, so I didn't get that experience. But my yeah. brother was a nerd. Who I There's several people in my life along the lines that have been into skating. And skate videos are some of the funniest, coolest, and dumbest things you have ever seen in your life. <laughs> they can be all and none of it, those like, things. Yeah. You're watching somebody like take it in the nuts yeah. four times in a row, then landing the most insane yeah. trick, and then stealing milk from a 7-Eleven. Right. And Where they're having so much much fun and all you want to do is like be there with them but they don't want you there they don't want you there <laughs> i know it's so frustrating it makes me really mad it's totally this like this boys club these dudes who are like yeah you want this lifestyle and you can't fucking have it but it also to me with from some of the skaters that i've known it, it it's not as boys club as much as it is like a little survival team right these are people who like get leave their house because they can't be in their house yeah. and they go skate all day because no one's telling them to come home at night. Right. And like, they're really good at it. It's it's the fucking latchkey kid of the yes. 80s and 90s that you and I experienced. Yeah. Like, go do something creative and like, con- uh, what's the word? Go do something constructive (laughs) or go do drugs. Like it's, Mm -hmm. you know, and I couldn't skateboard. They make, okay. So skate videos start coming out, which means that people all over the, like kids all over the country can actually see uh, what is happening instead of just photos and they lose their shit. (laughs) Um, Then they would watch it. And of course they'd have their favorites and Gator was the top of the fucking heap. It made them all skate stars, including, and in this group from San Diego is our friend, Tony Hawk. 
He's not our friend and we don't know him. Such a close friend of mine, personally. (laughs) But he's the face of it now. But the thing of... He was on a plane that we were on recently. No, you're thinking of the ice skater. (laughs) No, I'm not. (laughs) Aren't you? No. (laughs) Who was it? Oh, Sean White was on the plane. Sean White was on the plane. That's (laughs) right. <laughs> Wait, but we were also on the plane with an ice Johnny skate. Weir was Johnny like, Weir. Johnny was Johnny Weir. What? Wow, a lot. Just like cold weather sports guys. You and I would be really good at taboo <laughs> together as yes, a team. We would. People would not want to fuck with us. No, they wouldn't. We'd be champions. <laughs> we'd be on Thrasher for taboo, and the gestures would be huge, <laughs> and we'd get everything wrong. Yep. Um, <laughs> So, to, but Tony Hawk, like, okay, so if you think of Tony Hawk, too, he's, he was this, like, baby-faced little kid, skinny little nerd, um, but Gator was fucking hot. Yes. That's the other thing about him, is he looked like a man. He had muscles, he took his shirt off, he was fucking in your face, he was, like, the punk rock skater, and he was, like, hard-ass and mean, and, like, didn't give a shit, and threw himself into skating in a way that looked like he would break his fucking teeth off, and he did, and, like, didn't give a shit. Yeah, he so was there street. Was, he was, he like, was a street, street skater. And so there was something about him that made everyone just in awe of him, and so he be- he was the skater that everyone tried to emulate. He was the top fucking guy. Um, like, the rebel punk skate star, and everyone lost their minds. So there were these adolescent kids whose irresponsible behavior was fucking good for business. Yeah. Like the the more they punched a cop, the more fucking press they got. Sure. And they knew it. In an interview in Thrasher Magazine, Gator said that skating is, quote, a real productive way of venting some harsh aggressions. Instead of breaking a bottle and slashing someone's face, you're throwing yourself at a wall with sweat <laughs> dripping in your eyes. And he did have a rage issue that he got from his dad and ever, you know, everyone in the documentary would say that it, he, you know, on a dime would fucking just become a rageful, angry person out of nowhere. Yeah. So he was just this combination of style and edginess and being fucking hot and, all, you know, being charismatic as a lot of fucking crazy people are and it made him a star and he changed everything including making vision create a streetwear clothing for like that the reason they have vision streetwear is so that gator could fucking sell his shirts and berets and fucking stickers <laughs> and, and they say hip packs in the article but it's a fucking fanny pack it's a fanny pack Let's, i'll get on board yeah it's fine just be upfront about it yeah it's okay it's kind of like my favorite murder <laughs> we, how we stole how we saw hip packs and berets and <laughs> hip packs hip packs <laughs> you know um so here we go in 1987 a skate show in scottsdale arizona gator is introduced to a 15 year old and he's like i think he's like 21 at this point a 15 year old girl named brandy mclean and she's there so they live in arizona with her best friend jessica bergston um, Brandy is the fucking epitome of the California girl, like skate style, mid eighties. She's got the bleach blonde hair. She's fucking cute as shit. She's really outgoing and confident. Brandy and Gator, they fall in love immediately and they start a long term relationship or a long distance relationship. So by the time Brandy 17, Gator had, had moved throughout to California, which like if I were her parents, I would lose my fucking shit over mm-hmm. that to his house that he fucking owns. And um, they are, they're like the it couple and they're together in all these vision advertisements you can see from them, like the two of them together. They're in that, like the reason that article is called Free Fallen is because they're in the fucking Tom Petty Free Fallen video together. Oh, right. Because yeah. there's the slow motion skateboarding. Yeah, there's the skateboarding. So there's a, a lady skateboarding. It's not, her, that's not her. That's the main girl in the fucking video. But then when gate, when there's a guy skateboarding, it's up on the ramp that's gator mm-hmm. and the girl sitting next to him clapping is brandy like wow. they were fucking it yeah um and so they are in promotional videos for vision and that they vision had become the top selling skateboarding brand of the 80s and by 87 it's fucking huge they're live touring bringing in like five to eight thousand audience members a show doing these like crazy what do they call them? Like a demonstration? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, like he has photos with Cindy Crawford and he's on MTV with fucking downtown Julie Brown and shit. Like he's a fucking celebrity. Remember her? (laughs) And Dr. Ruth's over here. (laughs) And let's like just let's like tour through the 80s. Here's Bill Clinton. That's right. He plays a saxophone while he (laughs) under and he skateboards over him. It's great. Um, Yeah. So that's and so they're living the life. And um, Gleam in the Cube, etc., <laughs> which was filmed at my high school. The only good thing that ever happened in my high school. Oh, Christian Slater came. Yeah. Yeah. Irvine, what's up? Okay. They travel the world. They live it up. But of course, not shockingly, the 
relationship is tumultuous. Gator is often breaking up with Brandy when he had what she calls, and this is not me saying this, a quote, manic freak out mm. and would break up with her. And then two weeks later, be like, I love you. What did I do? I need you back for, you know, I'm fu- I fucked up. He was really possessive of her. He didn't want her even looking at anyone else. It was this really tumultuous relationship, the kind that is super fucking romantic when you're a teenager. Yes. And then you get older and you're like, that was really problematic. Yeah. Oh, that was not healthy. Well, as a teenager, though, it's when you get consistently served up some nice drama. Yeah. It feels, it makes you feel important. It makes it feel important. Totally. It's like that's, you begin to think that's what love is. Yeah. The problems. Sh- prove it to me by this is you know cry on my front lawn yeah if you like me so much that's right it's all a lot of that kind of stuff it's, yeah it's very lovely and hopefully we all get over that <laughs> someday <laughs> <laughs> um so gator becomes more and more arrogant he alienates himself from his buddies he's of course drinking and they're doing drugs all the time um and in the nine but then in the 90s the Gator's popularity starts to wane as vert skating is overtaken by street skateboarding, which is more the Z-Boys, Dogtown Z-Boys thing, where you skate off curbs and you make you do tricks on fucking flat surfaces and park benches. So it's more accessible to everyone and people kind of like it a little better. Mm-hmm. And the vert people couldn't fucking do that except for Tony Hawk, which is why we know who he is. So like they weren't like, to, like uh, Gator wasn't able to, to learn those tricks. Well, and, and neither was I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you watch those skate videos though, it's insane that the, anyone oh. can do those tricks. Like, especially that one where they go flying and then they skate down, um, the handrail of yeah. long stairs. Yeah. Everything about that is like, how did you do that the first time? Right. Because that's the scariest thing and there's no way well, that's you're the not. Thing is, you don't and you just keep doing it, which I'd be like, ow, that hurt. I did. I said, ow, that hurt. I'm never doing that again. Right. But and these, they're just like, I kind of can't feel my arms. I'm just going to keep doing it. There's a dog. Can I, can I pause real quick? A dog skateboarder? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, no. What's that dog skateboarder's name? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> will you put that on the, ev- will you leave that in? <laughs> I just texted Vince. Okay. I figured it out after a brief break. <laughs> His name is Murdy the dog. M U R D Y the D A W G. Nope, D A W G. You were thinking D A W G. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. He's the best fucking dog. He's called the smoothest skater on four paws. What was my point of this? Do you remember? Were you going to not show me? Oh, I, <laughs> I didn't know. Even. Oh, okay. She just puts her phone away. Yep. I just Here wanted to know his name and the spelling of his. No. Dude, he's so into it. He, he loves me. it. He loves it. He's like such a good pup. How's that going to cut together? <laughs> I don't know. It's going to be fun. Okay, <laughs> Steven, good luck with that. Okay, so unable to make the transition into fucking street skating, he, by 1990, he's washed up already as a fu- He's like 23 and he's like, uh, people are like laughing at him. Like kids who are skating at the skate park are like laughing at him. No. Yeah, so of course he's got this issue. I'm sure he has an ego fucking problem. Yes. Well, and also because... It's that thing of like the, the people that go through that go through it and never think they never think right. they're going to not be popular. Like, Plus, like, you know, if you become rich later in life, you like maybe have some you understand what not to fucking waste your money on and save some of it. But like if you're nah, not when you're 14. No, I don't think so. No, absolutely not. So he's washed up as his vision who files for chapter 11 bankruptcy oh. too, but oh. they come back. Don't worry about it. Oh, them. good, good, good. Yeah. So he's in Australia for some skate thing. This fucking little kid, I don't know how old he is, is bugging him and bugging him to get a fucking autograph. And he's like, leave me alone, whatever. He wouldn't leave him alone. Gator punches the kid in the face, <gasps> which is like, Australia is like, fuck you. Oh, my like, God. Like, so people start to hate him. Yeah. He's got major fucking issues, obviously. He's a fucking dick. You can't punch a you child. You can't punch a child. <laughs> Australia bans him. So, of course, sales there plummet. And everyone knows you need to be on Australia's good side. Yes. they're the fucking best. That's right. We Wait, love you. Let's shut go. up. <laughs> hey, Melbourne. Perth, we swear we'll come hey. someday. <laughs> Sydney, what's up? What a bridge. <laughs> what a bridge. <laughs> um, okay. And then things, this is where things like you can see they, they make a fucking hard ollie and turn around and <laughs> nice shit. thank you yeah um so he's in germany for a tournament gets blackout drunk on our best friend 
Jägermeister. Oh, God damn it. Which we know is just a gateway to stupid to shit. To the worst behavior. Also, it starts so smooth. Like, when you have your first shot of Jaeger, it tastes like medicine. And so it you're warms like, warms you. Yeah, you're, it warms you, but it also burns. So you're like, okay, I'm only going to do that once. Yeah. And then 19 of those later, That's you're right. punch, punching a mailbox or whatever. <laughs> no, you're not. You're falling out of a fucking hotel window and <gasps> landing on a wrought iron fence. Oh. That's what Gator fucking did. And no. it's this whole thing of like, did he jump out of it because he thought he could fly? Did he fall out of it? Did he put it like, it seems like he just fucking fell out of it but him jumping out to think he could fly because he was sh- blackout drunk which he always did yeah like doesn't seem out of character no either no um, for me you mean <laughs> <laughs> because you're right well it's one of those things where like it's the guy who has to be bigger than everyone else like there's video of him running around naked in the fucking hotel hallway and he always has to like he has to be the one and so i think like of all these like rebellious skater dudes he's the one that like scared them a little even yeah you which know is I mean? really saying something because i remember uh we had a friend who had skateboard friends that would come to comedy parties mm-hmm. and there was one time we were all drunk and like people are dancing in a circle and then one of the comics jumped in the middle of the circle and pretended he was going to take a shit in the middle of the circle and then of course jumped back out who and <laughs> nick schwartzen <laughs> and um the skateboard guy i remember going yeah the difference is if this was a skateboard party they really would have shit well then i don't want to go to a skateboard yeah party. i turned to the guy and i go then there would be shit in the living room <laughs> like that seems to be the disconnect yeah. but they it really is a who will go the furthest totally it's just boys who are left upstairs and no one's paying paying enough attention they never had to mature and of course there's like i hate this and i didn't want to call them like skateboard buddies but there's these skateboard groupies who like will love them no matter what they can get away with anything they don't have to be fucking mature in a relationship they can do whatever they want you know and no, why would they change and yes. they don't think they have to everyone's well, no, working it's, it's uh yeah it's almost like they were forced rich kids it's like unnaturally rich rich kids yeah yeah exactly no one handles any of that shit well no. then then you put some jägermeister except in there. tony hawk tony hawk who oh my god is he one i know nothing about <laughs> tony hawk he seems nice i don't i, I don't know I, I don't know he seems like a, i think he does charity things i just saw a thing where he p- posted a video of his daughter dropping in for the first time oh. and watching she stood there for so long and couldn't do it <gasps> couldn't scary. do it and then she finally does it uh, and it's see, the best video he's a great guy yeah our friend michelle balloon her daughter who's like eight mm-hmm. is learning to fucking skate I'm following them on Instagram. I think she's younger than eight. Jesus I think Christ. she's like more like she's six. She's like doing half pipes I and bet shit. She is. It's she's badass. Like really badass. Okay. So he falls on this fucking wrought iron fence, mm. impales the shit out of himself, Mm-mm. maybe hits his head. I don't know. So like, whatever. Um, he impales his neck, face, and <gasps> thumb. God. And he wakes up the next morning. It's like, what happened? He doesn't even remember. And they're like, we had to pull you off of a fence. And you then started trying to fight the fucking ambulance workers. Of like, course. He's out of control. Yeah. So he goes home to Carlsbad uh, to recover where he now lives with uh, Brandy in their condo. But he starts acting super fucking weird. First, he says, first, he wants to reinvent himself and changes his name from uh, Mark Gator Rogowski to uh, Mark to Gator Mark Anthony saying that his last name Rogowski uh, was the name of his dad, who we fucking never knew, so fuck him. Which is like, all right, fair enough, still. But again, like, again, with the nicknames or whatever, it's, the name isn't going to do it. That's not... No. If only it were that simple. And it was weird, because, like, everyone would be like, I was looking through Thrasher, and suddenly there's this guy named Mark, named Gator Mark Anthony. Who the <laughs> fuck is that? This guy is like, like, he, you know, I think a lot of people probably were distancing themselves from him at this point already. And then that happened. Then he becomes friends with an ex-surfer and skateboarder named Augie Constantino, who also had been badly injured in a dumb drinking incident. But Augie had found God from the incident. Okay. He was like, this, I, I need to learn. He couldn't fucking skateboard and surf anymore. So he becomes a born again Christian and he becomes Gator's spiritual advisor. Okay. And converts Gator to strict evangelical Christianity. Whatever it'll take to get Gator off that fence <laughs> is good. No. It's not. It's an, it's bad. Okay. We don't like it. He becomes fanatical about it. And okay. like in the documentary, one of his friends is like, he became fanatical about anything he did. Sure. So it's not like this was new. He said, Jesus Christ spoke to me through that incident with the fence. Mm-hmm. I was a blind dude, but now I can see. 
So he's born again. He be he starts covering his boards with religious symbols, preaching to fucking skaters and surfers and anyone else who will listen to him about his friend Jesus. Mm-hmm. He tells Brandy, who have, who's now been there for four fucking years of his bullshit. <laughs> so that means she's not in her teens anymore. Uh, that because of his newfound religion, they can't fuck anymore unless they get married. Oh. And she takes that chance to be like, great, goodbye. Like, oh, yeah. I, okay, great. I'm going to fucking take this as my... Aside from also Jesus has been talking to yeah. me a little bit too and yeah. told me to break up with you. Exactly. She's like, awesome. Um, she's sick of his bullshit, including bouts of violence and unprovoked jealousy. And she takes it as her opportunity. To get the fuck out of there. She goes home to her parents' house in San Diego, her mom and stepdad. Um, but the end of this relationship sends Gator fucking over the edge. He's already crazy. It has, it's not her fault. It has nothing to do with her. He's not treated and he's mentally ill. And he, and this is his fucking term, breaking point. Breaking yeah. point. So he starts drinking heavily again, using cocaine. Then Brandy starts dating a surfer pretty quickly after the breakup and, uh, which she's fucking allowed to do. Yeah. And Gator becomes obsessively jealous, starts stalking her, fucking breaks into her house and steals back all the shit he gave her, including a car. Oh. steals her car. Wow. And then ca- making threatening calls to her house, to her fucking new boyfriend's family's house. Somehow he got the number. Like, he's stalking the shit out of her. So he's, again, fa- he's a fanatic he's about a, yes about making their lives hell. Exactly. Um, and finally, she tries to, like, have a conversation with him and, like, hang out with him. And he's like, I should fucking take you to the desert and kill you and leave you there. <sighs> And she's just like, my mom knows where I am. Take me home right now. And that's where she's like, I need to leave town. So she doesn't want him to be able to track her because clearly he can right now. So she doesn't tell anyone that she's leaving town and she, except her parents. And she doesn't tell anyone where she's going or why. She just is like, I need to just leave so no one can track me. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, this is the fatal move because her best friend from way back in Arizona, Jessica, doesn't know that. Ugh. And doesn't know what's been going on because, of course, Gator isolated B- Brandy and was like, you can't have friends. You can't go out with your friends. So they weren't talking as much anymore. And so Jessica didn't really know what's going on okay. in their relationship. So Jessica had been living in Arizona and she moved to San Diego. She was like this gorgeous girl. She was going to be a model. She was going to open a flower store. So she's 20. It's March 1991. She's 22 years old. And she had just been in San Diego for like 10 days. She gets a hold of Gator and she's like the only per this is the only person I know her know here. He's 24 years old. And she was like, Can you show me around and like introduce me to people? Uh-huh. And um sh- like Brandy, she's this tall, blonde, beautiful girl. Uh her friends describe her as tough and savvy and incredibly intel- intelligent and free spirited. So on March 21st, 1991, they spend the day together. They go to lunch, they fucking hang out all day. There's no it's there's no undertone of hooking up. And I get this too, where it's like, you know what your friends, boyfriends or ex-boyfriends are like, I'm safe because you dated my friend. We're never going to hook up. Right. They go back to Gator's condo to watch movies and drink wine. And around 2.30 AM, she's like, I'm ready to go home. He insists on taking her home. He's like, let me make sure my driver's license is in my car. He goes out to the car and instead of his driver's license, he grabs his club, which we remember as... I don't think people know what it is anymore. It's a metal auto <clears throat> anti-theft device. My dad still uses it because it's a dad thing. <laughs> he bought me one when I got my first car. It's the thing where you put it around, like it's a it's a locking mechanism for the steering wheel. That's like a metal thing that you that you can't steal the car when it's on. You, yeah, you can't drive because it blocks the the steering wheel. Right, it blocks the steering wheel from moving. So, and it's also like it's sh- you, you know if you look in the car, you'll see it. You'll go to another car. Right. My dad still uses his. Except for the people that are good at stealing right. cars break in and then cut that little part right. of the steering wheel and take it off. Oh. Yeah. Shit. Because it only works if there's two sides of the steering wheel. Oh, I'm stealing cars from now on. <laughs> I didn't even know that. Ask me about these things. <laughs> I'll tell you. Shit. Karen's led a life of positivity. <laughs> so positive. Um, so for some reason, and it was, so it was like this metal bar. Yeah. He brings it in to the house. No. I know. And he... Uh, she's on the floor getting her stuff together, getting ready to leave. And he strikes her over the head with it multiple times, knocking her unconscious, just 
out of nowhere. They've been spending the fucking day together, like hanging out. And then he just snaps. And he snaps. Fuck. Um, we don't know if he maybe put the moves on her and she was like, no, this isn't happening. But later he says that that in his mind somewhere during the day, she just turned into Brandy in his mind. <sighs> like she was, he wanted to do this to Brandy and instead he did it to her best friend. So uh, he knocks her unconscious. He ties her up in his bedroom, rapes her for a long period of time. And then um, he he uh, smothers her when he puts her in a surfboarding bag. Mm. And he takes all the evidence and drives a couple hours out to the desert and buries her in a shallow grave. So literally exactly what he threatened to do to Brandy. That's exactly right. Unbelievable. It's crazy. It's so fucking heartbreaking. The next day, Jessica's dad back in Arizona is like, why, hasn't I, why haven't I heard from her? Immediately files a missing persons report, ends up flying out because he doesn't think San Diego PD is doing enough. Of course, I'm sure no dad ever thinks the fucking PD is doing enough. Of course. Um, and so for the next two months, friends are putting up missing flyer, missing persons flyers. Even the dad even goes like sees Gator and was like, do know where she is they had like shaken hands and gator was like i don't know where she is to her dad's fucking face Ugh. um and so so jessica bergson's body is found by campers or like it sounds like it was like a kid fucking mountain biking out there on april 10th 1991 but i think it was so far away and the body is so decomposed that there's they can't identify her so i don't think they knew that she was it was her yet right but the next day uh, apparently filled with fucking guilt, maybe. Gator confesses to his friend, the surfer dude, Constantine O, who told him that he needs to confess, takes him to the fucking cops and is like, go in there and confess. Oh, good. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, maybe he would have never been caught. It's, yeah. it's very possible if he hadn't confessed, he would have never been caught, which yeah. is so fucking awful. So, uh, Gator turns himself in on April 11th, 1991, and he, to, just to prove that he did it, he has to lead them to where he buried her. They were like, what murder are you talking about? They didn't even know about it. Uh. Um, and then police search his home. They find evidence of the blood. He had bought like a fucking steam cleaner for his rug, but they pulled it up and, it, and the blood had gone all the way down to the floorboards. And uh, he says that he killed her in a misplaced act of revenge toward his ex, Brandy. He said that she was the mold of brandy the mold that brandy was made out of so this guy this fucking asshole is so problematic there's certain parts where he seems to take full responsibility for it there's other times where he's like he says it was because of porn that he watched as a kid he says that it, you know it's because of fucking um un having unmarried sex before corrupted him and it's satan like he won't it, he's a fucking dick. Um, and well, he's, it, obviously, he hasn't come to terms. Right. So then it's just, here's the reason and here's the excuse. Here's the reason and excuse so I don't feel terrible about myself. Yeah. And so I don't have to take any responsibility for this. Yeah. So upon entering prison, he's diagnosed with severe bipolar. Uh. And so, but of course, he also said that he had thought about getting psychiatric help, but uh, his religion, his newfound religion didn't frown upon that. Go, there's no Satan. Go get help, yeah. everyone. Well, and also, I don't understand how a religion could frown upon you getting better. Totally. If you are suffering. A hundred percent. That, I, yeah, that doesn't seem to track. That, well, what the thing is, that is, the, the point is that it's your fault. And if you are a better person and pray more, it'll go away. And because it's not gone away, that means you're a piece of shit. Like, that's not... That's not science. That's not science. That's not how it actually works. If your religion's trying to teach you that, it's because they're trying to keep you down. Yeah. And, y and you need to question that. Yeah. So, of course, the story blows the fuck up. It's this perfect story for the media. Hard copy does a dramatic reenactment. Ugh. And I'm sure the actress quit acting immediately <laughs> after that. The reenactments from the 80s and 90s. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, may they all die a quiet death. That's because right. Because there have been some awful ones. Horrible. Um, he changes the story, makes a bunch of bullshit, says it was kinky sex gone wrong. Fuck you. He tells his friends to believe in him. They don't. and They do and then don't. He eventually pleads guilty to first degree murder and rape, avoiding the death penalty or life without parole. So in January 1992, at the plea hearing, he submits a four page written statement accepting responsibility, but also blames himself for having sex outside of marriage, for being promiscuous, all this other bullshit. Who fucking cares? He sentenced on March 6th, 1992. Uh, so 
that day that he's sentenced, five extra un- um, uniform bailiffs have to be there with metal detectors as guards because Jessica's dad says, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to fucking kill that motherfucker. Oh, no. Yeah. Um, Rogowski apologizes to Mr. Bergstein, who shouts back in a 20 minute fucking monologue of what a piece of shit this guy is. Everyone's crying while he does it. He says that he's a coward and he should die a thousand deaths. So Rogowski receives six years for forcible rape, then 25 years um, for the first degree murder charges, and he's eligible for per- per- parole after 31 years. So February 7th, 2011, he's denied parole. Thank God. Oh. Saying that he's an unreasonable risk to society. In 2016, he's again denied parole for seven years. So he's not going to be eligible for parole until March of 2023, which marks the minimum of his sentence when he'll be in his mid 50s. Mm. So, yeah, it's horrible, awful. Jessica is buried in a family plot in Georgia. On the day of her burial, her father compared her to a butterfly that had just landed on his arm and said, like a butterfly, she was only on this earth a short time, but brought so much beauty and happiness. And that is the murder of Jessica Bergston by Mark Gator Rogowski. Wow. Fucking crazy. So the fact that something that dark and awful happened in that kind of like, you know, it was, there was a little innocence to that playful world. Yes. It's like, it's, it's a hobby. It's a, it's people getting great at a pastime and then being cool at a pastime and then then succeeding. Yeah. And here's my line of shoes and I'm Tony Alva and all that where it's all very like hooray for the little guy. So the idea that then the little guy, it turns that hard. Well, that's why I think you don't hear about it a lot is a lot of skaters don't want to fucking talk about it. Yeah. it, It just marred their whole career. Like it marred their whole, what's the word? Job. The whole scene. The whole scene. It made everyone look bad. You yes. know, it was like the whole, it was also in the 80s, the satanic panic, and everyone wanted to make these guys look like, you know, the bad boys and shit. But so they don't, no one talks about it. Yeah. But there's this thing that happened, and it really happened. Yeah. Wow. Unbelievable. Really. Well, so while we were um, on the road, when we did our weekend that was Baltimore, Philly, DC, mm-hmm. I kept finding a show on TV called Deadly Rich. Mm. I think it was on HLN. And I was, it was so satisfying. It was just like all these stories of rich people murdering each other. (laughs) Because, and every single time it was, you know, there's, there's some like son that is a 'er ne'er-do-well. Right. And then someone finds out that there's a life insurance for $2 million on his mother. There's all those stories. greed, greed, greed. Insane greed and also really... Uh, just no ability to kind of big picture yeah. it, where it's like this absolutely you're gonna get go, caught you're gonna get caught it's almost like it's the murders and shit that in the crimes that wouldn't happen if you were just average person yes but suddenly it's like i got cut out of the will and right. i thought i was gonna live off this three million dollars for the rest of my and life i've been acting like it yeah and now i get nothing and it's because this old bat so you know here it's we go people not living positively so <laughs> there's a ton of negativity but please watch deadly rich Oh my god. It <laughs> so, sounds awful and amazing. Yeah. Um and and so satisfying like we us coming home from a night of mm. doing shows and then you're just like, "Ah, oh, yes. Um people being pushed down long flights of stairs. <laughs> grand flights of just stairs. Just the grandest the grandest doms. Grand dom. Um so this one came up in one of those episodes and I it's so funny because I pulled it because knowing that we had a Detroit show coming up. Yeah. Because it was near Detroit. And then then began my long journey in did we do this one already or not? Okay. And me, Stephen, Jay, like a bunch of us looking into it couldn't figure it out for the longest Too bad time. you couldn't have asked me. Well, I know. I couldn't have asked you. And um, when Stephen and I were looking into it, it was, it was a thing where I had basically said I was going to do it and had research oh, for live. it okay. and then changed my mind Last day of. Okay. And the funny thing is Stephen goes, yeah, no, in that Detroit show. And he's mentioning stories where I'm like, I have no idea what you're yeah. talking about. 100%. I have n- no memory of it. Yeah. It was very like email records. Tech, it was like, you know, yes, the whole thing. we had to like, we had to go onto the motherboard and get the mainframe up. Isn't that funny when you like ask people who listen, have we done this? Cause it's been three years of insanity and we haven't caught up with our brains yet. Yes. So week by week for the past, 
past three years. We don't fucking know what we've been doing. Well, and also those live shows, we change our mind day of yeah. constantly. There's something that goes, it's like the part of the panic of this is going to be a live show yeah. story. And suddenly it's like, it isn't good or is good or whatever. Yeah. But I've been, but also the reason that I couldn't figure it out is because this story has been on Dateline. It's been on every single one of them yeah. has, has featured this. So story. it's like, how have we not done that? Kind it's of. a city confidential. I it's, love it. You've seen it a million times. Okay. Be- and because it's incredibly lurid. Okay. Um, it's the murder of Jane Bashara. Which so she? she, her, it's okay. Like, just, <laughs> you know what? Just, how about you tell how me? How about I don't tell you and then I tell you. <laughs> yeah, how about you just tell me, tell me. Um, okay. So yeah, Deadly Rich is, is the main source. And then obviously all the um, Wikipedia style um and Murderpedia again. Mm. Murderpedia, please donate to. Please keep Murderpedia alive for us. Um, okay, so we'll talk. First, we'll talk about Jane Bashara. She um, is a 56 year old woman who lives in the very affluent Detroit suburb of Gross Point Park mm-hmm. um, uh, with her husband of 26 years, Bob, and their two children. She has a bachelor's and a master's in business administration. Damn girl. And yeah, and she has this really um, high level job, senior market marketing manager for an energy consulting company in that Detroit. Sounds fancy as fuck. Yeah, she's got so many blouses Ugh, with ties and ruffled real necks. Silk too. Yes. Her nails were perfect. Tennis bracelets. Just every day, she was wearing those Eileen Fisher separate. Oh my god, and like walkable heels. Yes, but still very fashionable. I love her. Um, yeah, and she's well respected at work, but she's also active in her kids' lives. She's basically doing that suburban mom thing where yeah. she's doing it all. She was um, actually the president of the Gross Point South High School Mothers Club. Jesus, they have a mothers club. I mean, I apparently, and that's the kind of thing that if I even put like the flyer in front of my mom, she'd be like, "Get it away from me." Rich people have so many clubs. They have clubs, and they they basically know how to manage their time. Like I think it's like they don't eat carbs, so they have a lot of energy. Oh, so not tired all the time. They're like, and they have nannies and house cleaners and shit. So they're like, well, I didn't spend four hours doing. But they, but they were also raised by like surgeons and shit. So they're like, this is not important. This right. is important. I, the, my new favorite phrase is generational wealth. Yes. Because like, that's what some people are used to. Yeah. It's like, they've, there hasn't been a poor person around here <laughs> for, for 20 20 years. Years. <laughs> In gross point blank cell. Right. Okay. So but he, she's just basically doing it all okay. and killing it. Her husband, Bob, is a 54-year-old businessman who owns and manages about 50 rental properties in the area. Uh-huh. Um, and his father, he's from a, a like on a wealthy and successful family because his father was a state appellate court judge. Shit. So, um, mm, I'm on my laptop and I do the thing where I scroll down with the button <laughs> and, and then, then it flips me back oh, up. No. Bob also is m- a lot, very much into philanthropy. Um, and he is the president of Gross, the Gross Point Rotary Club, okay. uh, where he is known for and lauded for collecting a million pounds of non-perishable food, a million pounds of books, and a million pounds of clothing for families. And then me. lighting it all on fire. <laughs> oh, <laughs> saying, okay. you'll get it when you stop doing <laughs> drugs. Um, no. All right. That's nice. He basically is all about giving back. Okay, great. And obviously, um, yeah, that's what this family is all about. They're basically an all-American Midwest family that's on the, you know, upper, upper range of doing great. Okay. So, um, it's very surprising Uh when on January 24th, 2012, um, Jane Bashar leaves for work, uh, sorry. It's very surprising that on January 24th, 2012, Jane Bashara leaves work around four o'clock from her um, downtown Detroit office building. Uh, she talks to her daughter on her cell phone as she drives home. And then that night at around eight o'clock, her husband, Bob, comes home from work and um, and he had been doing maintenance repairs on one of his rental properties. He sees Jane's not home. He tries her cell. She doesn't answer. And he just figures she's out running errands. They're both busy people. That's pretty standard fare. Mm-hmm. Um, so then he just basically goes about his business and relaxes. But around 930, when there's still no sign of Jane, he calls some friends and family members. He calls his own kids, basically saying, have you talked to mom? Where is she? Mm-hmm. What's going on? Um, then he notices her work ideas in the house. 
which means she came home after work and then went out after. But her um, her car isn't in the driveway. So by 1130 at night, Bob decides it's time to call the police and like basically yeah. file a missing persons report. So on Deadly Rich, my favorite new show. Sure. Um, they had a 911 call that I didn't <gasps> get to the clicker in time for. So yes. I had to listen to it. And... This is another, we've talked about this a lot. So I'm the person I don't want to hear 911 calls. I don't want to see crime scene photos. Um, but on this one, I, I think I let it. Well, I it's not like a panic. I found a body call. So right. it's not like the same thing. It's not someone pretending to be upset, right. which for some reason upsets me 10 times more than how yeah. they're faking it. Yeah. But what is funny is he's trying to sound casual, which is just that thing where it's you like... You can't sound casual. No, you can't. And and it's acting is very hard. <laughs> I think people don't understand that. You're being recorded. Yeah. And basically, you're auditioning. Yeah. As you're the, you're the husband that's mildly concerned, but knows there's nothing really to worry about. And I like, it's kind of like, do, are there couples who don't know each other's whereabouts for hours? I mean, well, like, this, this is back then... Uh, I guess no, not. It's 2012. Yeah. As, as a fucking very, co- not codependent, we, in therapy, <laughs> we call it interdependent. <laughs> as a very, as part of a very interdependent couplehood, we know each, where the other's at all the time. Yes. Constantly. It would make sense. Now, these people are like well into their age. They're rich. They have it children. Might get, it might get old. You guys both yeah. might be like, enough of this yeah, checking don't, out. I don't care where you are. You're at the bar still. Yes. I don't know. I, I know where you are. Yeah, exactly. Okay. But at the same time, it is weird that it, just to have no idea. Sure. And then it's hundred, almost midnight. Yes. No, thanks. Okay. Um, I would hope to someday be in an interdependent <laughs> relationship where someone would give a shit if I didn't come home by 1130. Uh, it's me. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Oh, is it going to be you? <laughs> God damn Karen, it. Karen, why aren't you home? <laughs> And then I start rebelling against you. Yeah. I can do what I fucking want. Yeah, you can. Oh, oh, I can. <laughs> No, I don't know what to do. Okay. So the next morning around 930 in the morning, a tow truck diver comes upon Jane's Mercedes Benz SUV and, because it's parked in an alleyway in mm. East Detroit. I don't know this one at all. You don't? No. Okay. Hold on because the details might start okay. to come to you. All right. Um, this alley is six miles away from where they live. And it's it's clearly not in, like, it's a d- totally different part of town. Mm-hmm. The driver notifies the authorities. When the police come to look at the vehicle, they find the dead body of Jane <gasps> Bashara in the back seat of oh, her own car. Honey. Yeah. Um, they take the, the body to Wayne County Medical Examiner's office, and there they determine that um, her cause of dra- death is strangulation. Really? Okay, so two days later, Gross Point Park Police issue a statement saying that Bob Bashara is currently their only person of interest. Hmm. Obviously, as as it all goes, and we know the husband did it, you look at the husband first. Um, Bob is cooperating with the authorities. He uh, comes in for questioning. He also takes a polygraph test. So they're kind of like, did he not do it? Well, tell me more. I will. I'd love to. <laughs> I'm being positive. <laughs> I want to know. Um, yeah, it's really op- it's open minded yeah. of you to say, did he not do it? I know. So both Bob's side of the family and Jane's side of the family comes forward immediately to say there is no way he did this. I will never say that. I'm sorry, Yolanda and Andy, my <laughs> in-law, my brother-in-law and my sister-in-law. I will always say he definitely or she definitely did it. I did it. Even if you didn't. Well, isn't that the worst thing in the world, though? And I think it, yeah. it's also one of my worst fears is the discovery that you there are people that you would know where you'd be like, of course, Stephen Defend, would never murder defending anybody. Defending a murderer. Yes. And then you're wrong. Well, that's what people, like a bunch of the skateboarders did, like free fucking free gator. And of like, of course, but it turns out you're just a piece of shit. He's a murderer. Yeah. That's, it's a big fear. It's a big fear. And also it's like, it's what is the, what is the extent of friendship? Yeah. How well does anybody you don't know, know anybody? Anyone. No one knows anybody. No. And as we've talked about a billion times, the sociopaths and the psychopaths, Right. Are the most convincing. We know if Stephen got, I would say Stephen did it. There's like a murder that didn't even happen yet. Yeah. Like, I know Stephen did <laughs> look, it. Look, <laughs> look. Listen. Stephen is the last person we'd accuse. So Stephen's the first person we're going to accuse. Exactly. That's how, that's how our thinking yeah. goes. So, um, 
But both families assert that he's incapable of this horrific act. That's a quote. Um, they also are quick to defend uh, one of the neighbors named, unfortunately, Alex Jones said, um, <laughs> said blue blah, blee blah, um, <laughs> said they were just a great couple. There's no doubt in my mind that it was not him. Oh. So and um, so after the questioning, then the police do reveal. And this is what's interesting is I feel like this is one of those things where um, local news had caught on to that kind of OJ CNN minute by minute Ugh, reporting yeah. where it's such in that neighborhood. It was such a shock that this woman, this white rich woman was found dead yeah. in her own car. That then that basically everything that happens in this case happens on the news. I mean, those people love nothing. The news people, news people nothing more than fucking cops coming out of a mansion yes. with yellow tape. Like, that's their favorite fucking thing and they'll sit on that for hours. That's that's media birthday party. That's right. That's just like, we all go to the state skating rink and eat <laughs> cupcakes together because that's, that's right. this is, and it gets even more so. Okay, good. Um, which I mean, is not good, crazy, obviously. but yeah, I mean, that's how it is. So, um, so the thing is that the police reveal that Bob was found to be lying on his polygraph test. Uh -uh. They won't disclose what he's lying about, but they basically are like, we're still looking at him. Would you ever take a polygraph test? It like, doesn't seem like a good idea. If you were innocent and you were like, I didn't do this. It doesn't seem like it's going to help you either way. I don't trust my own <laughs> self con yeah. self con subconscious what is the problem with that word today you th that's like that's your subconscious that's my subconscious saying don't fucking talk don't about trust me. yourself how dare you talk about me in front of these people <laughs> um i just don't i don't know what i would do like i feel like all of a sudden my hands would get sweaty yeah. in a way that would be like the thing of like i'm not stealing anything yes. when you're not stealing anything <laughs> i'm totally innocent right it's like yeah you are yeah right but then you look guilty if you don't take one i i am so I paid too close attention to things to not seem suspicious. Right. Me too. Ask for a lawyer. That's yes. I always ask for a lawyer and just kind of put your hands up like, just be like, I don't know. Look, Karen, I don't know what to tell you. My lawyers, Karen and Georgia told me to ask for <laughs> another lawyer because, because my, I have such a guilty conscience. Yeah. It would be all be coming up and it wouldn't be related to the crime. Totally. They arrested like, me for. Yeah. My name is Karen, but they, my parents wanted to name me Gloria. <laughs> <laughs> so you're lying. About so I it. am kind of lying, I guess in a way. <laughs> yeah. Ma'am. Please just answer the question. <laughs> well, actually, do I have a couple questions about the question. <laughs> okay, so. Okay. For real, seriously. For real now. So, um, on January 28th, this is, so this is about four days later, the police searched the Bashar's home for potential evidence. Um, and they are seen, and, you know, it's all on the local news cameras. Mm -hmm. They're seen leaving the home with several items. Let me guess. It's like a fucking brick, uh, what a Tudor, 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 yeah. A Tudor with some fucking columns and yes. shit and yes. fucking clapboard bullshit. You've seen this. You've seen it. I've this. seen it. You know it. Okay. In your subconscious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, a few days later, on January 31st, investigators announced that Jane had been murdered somewhere else and her body was placed in her car mm -hmm. after death. Um, so, um, now the, it goes on for a while where they're, they're, um, they're watching Bob Bashara. He's, um, you know, he's like basically saying, I was gone, I was gone that day. These are my, and this is my favorite part. Uh, well, I'll, I'll come to this later, but because Bob, the um, buildings that he owns. Yeah, I was just going to say, can I make a guess? Anyone who works in like a construction industry or some kind of thing where they have they have workers. Yes. Who they can hire to kill the wife and make it look like a random act of violence. So, you know, this one. Yeah. So stop ruining my story. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But this is literally the yeah. next paragraph is the same day that they announced that all of a sudden out of the fucking blue, a guy walks into the police station on January 31st. His name is Joe Gentz. Um, he is Bob Bashara's handyman oh. who has worked on different um, jobs, odd jobs for Bob Bashara over the years, um, comes forward to the police confessing he killed Jane <gasps> Bashara. So uh, he tells 
he tells police in the um, uh, when they interrogate him or whatever that Bob Bashara had promised to pay him two thousand dollars and give him an old Cadillac. Oh, that makes in exchange so for sad. killing Jane Bashara. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Um, I mean, not that any amount of money is okay to kill someone, but it's like. That's so sad. It's terrible. Like, and she is such an important person to so many people, and for fucking two grand? It's just all the dirtiest, grossest. It's just, like, what you don't want to know about other human yeah, beings. Yeah, it's like a human being's life is n- nothing to you. Yeah. So, Joe states that he agreed to the terms. He strangled Jane in the Bashar's garage, oh. and then he helped Bob, Bob dispose of her <gasps> body by placing it in the back of the SUV and driving it to the alley in Detroit. Um, city where it was found. Joe chose to confess out of the fear that if um, any of that information got got out, that all the blame would lay on him and Bob would get away with no consequences. Uh-oh. So he basically was saying, I'm coming forward and admitting to this because I want to make sure this guy goes down because it was his idea. And Joe Gens is, uh, they call him, it's, they use different phrases. Mentally challenged is one, like just has a low IQ yeah. is another. Yeah. But he seems to be the kind of person that would be easily manipulated right. and, and is basically kind of saying, please, Make sure that I'm not the only person that goes down for this. The problem is that Joe Gens's story is inconsistent. In one account, he says that Bob Bashara struck a deal with him to kill Jane. Another one, he says that Bashara forced him to kill Jane at gunpoint, Uh. um, saying that if he didn't kill her, that then he would kill Gens. Mm -hmm. So if Gens didn't kill Jane, that Bashara would kill Gens. So, um, Immediately then, Bob Bashara's attorney, um, a guy named David Grime, co- um, he claims that Bashar had actually owed Gens the two grand and that Gens murdered Jane Bashara out of anger for not being, for not repaying him. Hmm. Which doesn't really track. Yeah. Bob maintains that he was in no way involved with Jane's murder and that, um, his team leans on Gens's mental disability to call the confession into question. So it's basically like, this guy doesn't know yeah. what he's talking about. He also says that he doesn't, that Bob doesn't even own a gun. So the version of Gens's story couldn't be true. And the authorities hold Gens for three days to question him. But then they basically say, you're right. This is a false confession. And they dismiss the confession and they release Joe Gens. What? Yes. Okay. What is that? I don't know what's true anymore. I know. Right. So, and neither do the police. So then, okay. But the thing is the media already has their teeth in this story oh, sure. and it's the classic, like th- then the, there's a confession, but the confession doesn't stick. So it's almost like good that the media is involved because they're like, wait a fucking goddamn minute. Yes. Yeah. And they're, and they're like, well, there's gotta be other stuff and there's gotta yeah. be people willing to and talk. We need more video footage of tutors. That's right. Being <laughs> That's rated. Right. We need houses being, uh, rated fully, <laughs> fully rated. Yeah. And men in blazers walking out and looking concerned. That's right. Um, we all need that. So, uh, okay. So then on February 2nd, 2012, the story breaks that Bob Bashara has been leading a double life. Of course he has. And is this the part? This might be the part that clicks it okay. over into true familiarity for you. Okay. Because not only has Bob Bashara been having an affair with a woman um, and keeping, basically keeping a woman. Of course. Um, he's also, he runs a secret S&M club. How the fuck have I never heard of this? You, okay. So I that would have been, that would have been the detail. That was, n- that would have been the trigger that clicked it into my memory. Because that, if, no. if the other part was the media birthday party at the roller rink, <laughs> then that was the Coke dealer showing up and saying everything's for free. Because... <laughs> A a uh, a murder in the suburbs, oh. and then the husband has a double life as a sex S and M guy. I can hear the City Confidential episode, uh, which is real. my favorite fucking show in the whole world. Yes, they fucking interview the local journalists. They fucking it's just the best. Yes, they. Oh and, my god! And the, in the sleepy bird, but all was not well. <laughs> yes. in the, mm. So in this episode of Deadly Rich, so that I'm sure there's a City Confidential. Yes. I'm positive about 100%. it, but. In this episode, there is a guy named Mike Boyanis, and he runs the bar 
um, yes. called the Hard Luck Lounge. The local fucking dive. Yep. Where and the journalists go to eat. Well, that Bob Ashara owns the building. Shit. So he's basically Mike Boyanis's landlord. Fuck. And the, this, the episode of Deadly Rich kicks off with Mike Boyanis being like, he wasn't my friend. He was my landlord. Whoa. He, he gave everybody the creeps, like him <laughs> just holding forth. And so then one day <laughs> we have to go there next time we're in Detroit. The Hard Luck Lounge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope it's still there because this guy, I love him so much. And he says at one point the fuse box like blew out yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So they had to get an electrician and they went downstairs into what was known as Bob's office Uh-oh. that no one went downstairs into. Mm. He kept it locked. But the electrician has to go in there because that's where the fuse box is. Oh, God. The electrician comes back upstairs and is like, yeah, so he's got like whips and chains <gasps> and things to hang he's, people from the ceiling. He's the real Fifty Shades of Grey. It's not some <laughs> fucking hot dude no. with like clean fucking equipment. It's not a hot millionaire. It's Bob Bouchard. In the, in the basement. With some fucking greasy ass shit. Shit under the hard luck lounge. Oh. Mike Boyanis says to the electrician, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> he basically <laughs> goes like, do not make me think about that. I don't want to know. Oh my God. Yes. So basically these people, the people that know the real Bob Bouchard start coming forward and going, you might want to check this yeah. and you might want to check that. So that's how all this stuff starts coming out. Okay. Um, and of course the media is having an insane S and M field day. This is their dream come true. It's fucking story of the century. This is prom queen city. <laughs> okay. So th- then also Wait, prom queen city is the name of the episode. <laughs> Right? Sure. Okay, great. <laughs> so then they also start learning about this woman that is basically this kept woman that Bob is, it's like his secret girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, Bob comes out and says, no, 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 we're only friends. Um, but then, of course, the pictures and the travel documents surface that prove that Bob took a trip with this woman out of state to one of her relatives' weddings. See, this is what happens when you're not interdependent. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't track the fact that your fucking husband is going to weddings of other people's cousins. And imagine, this isn't like a sexy, hot sex relationship where That's they're like, not. meet me in the basement, I'm gonna hang you up no, by your ankles. it's like, kick me in the dick until I cry. It's This is like, I'll go to your cousin's wedding in <laughs> Albuquerque? No! Like, he's do- he's That's in S&M. There. He's like, like, I'm gonna cause you pain. Yep. I'm gonna make you go to my you're, cousin's You're gonna make small talk with my Aunt Marie. <laughs> Well, you eat canapes in the sun. <laughs> oh, my God. That's the real S&M right there. That's so, right. <laughs> so, but basically, all this proof is coming up where it's like, yeah. no, no, no. Everybody knows that you were actually not only like she was his real girlfriend. He was keeping her yeah. um, in an apartment above the hard luck lounge. Shit. So her apartment's up here. Then poor Mike's in the middle going, get out of here. Why does she and Mike fall in love and run away together? No, Mike talks about it very early on that his wife is in okay. the mix. Okay, great. And he said um, he, that nobody, uh, when Bob came around, he was a terrible tipper. He never paid for the drinks that he ordered. Of not. None of the guys liked him because he was a dickhead. And none, all the women were super skeeved out by Ew. him. Including his wife who said she, the only time she ever shook Bob Bajar's hand, the hair on the back of her neck stood Ugh. up. So, um, we gotta love Mike, who is the true nar- narrator Mike. of this show. And he's just like, ugh. So there's a point where okay. the police are, um, surveilling Bob Bashar and like watching his every move, mm-hmm. right? Because everybody kind of knows this guy is dirty and in the mix and something has gone on and we have to get him for it and Mike is watching it on the news and goes he realizes as he's watching the news story and he goes oh this guy's gonna use the he's gonna use the hard luck as an alibi he's like (gasps) oh we're gonna get pulled into this like he's watching it on the news going this son of a bitch is gonna make this his alibi because oh it, after God. a while it gets so crazy yeah, yeah. of him being accused and saying no what are you talking about i would never go to that part of town and all okay so okay so the woman who was the kept woman mm-hmm. um she's basically they're kind of tracking her life as well she was normally a model employee i'm not giving her name or where she worked why but you can no look it need up. to i mean yeah whatever this is a this has is nothing about, to do with her yeah she's more of a she's an innocent innocent in this yeah maybe oh but who also who cares yeah like i don't know (laughs) uh she's she's definitely we don't know how innocent and how involved and what demands she was making on Mm. him but uh i don't know Um, she wasn't demanding that he fucking kill his wife do we know that though we don't so 
basically being positive. Be- <laughs> you're being positive, and I'm saying there was reports that woman was <gasps> considered a model employee at her work, but then um, slowly it starts developing a bad reputation for her apathetic and sometimes aggressive attitude at work. Mm. And then in 2011, um, she changed her emergency contact from a female friend to Bob Bashara. So she's. I mean, that's kind of like you're out and about with like, that's my yeah, boyfriend. because this motherfucker says my, my, my marriage is, we don't sleep in the same room. Yes. It's not, this is, she knows about you. It's totally fine. Yes. I'm going to leave her soon and we're going to get married. And then she's like, well, if all that's the case, then you're going to be my emergency contact. Yeah. <laughs> that's the basics of like, you're my person. Yes. It's actually, you know, a very sad thing when you go to fill out an emergency contact and you have to figure out who's name to put on there. <laughs> That's a very, that was yeah. a very dark post-divorce time for me. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, I'm my emergency contact now. I had a post-friendship of that where it was like, well, who do, I, I clearly didn't trust the dudes I had been dating before that because I always <laughs> use her name. <laughs> and then when we, she and I had like a falling out and broke up, it was like, I have to use my guy's name? Yeah. I guess I have to stay with him. What if something happened to you and then they call someone that doesn't like you anymore? Yeah, she's like, great, leave her alone. Leave her, leave her where she lies. She said, don't resuscitate her. Oh, did she? <laughs> She told me, let's let her have that seizure out in public. Yeah, she doesn't want stitches and don't resuscitate. <laughs> Goodbye. She doesn't like stitches. <laughs> After receiving a poor performance review in 2009, she chalked her poor performance up to family issues, but then promised her performance would improve, but it, it only got worse. And the day Jane's body was found, this <gasps> woman left work without any notice and was later fired. So mm. there's a connection that that would indicate perhaps that she knew what was going on. Perhaps, but I don't know, man. I want to defend her. Okay, you can. I in my mind. Good night. Would you defend her if I told you that this woman is Casey Anthony? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. Are you lying? Yes. You fucking cut. <laughs> I believed you. <laughs> it all. It's like every oh every God. terrible true crime story. It's like a jam band of true crime assholes. <laughs> okay. Okay. No, I I still believe in her. Okay. So. Um, it's basically revealed that Bob and this woman's relationship is based around their mutual love for S and M. Great, and the, um, that whose isn't? I just want I to mean, go ahead and say, really, at the end of the day, let's <laughs> not that is shame because it's hot. Kick me in the dick. <laughs> I love it. Uh, whips and chains, sure. and chips and dips. <laughs> um, so. That's a, that's a line from a, like a Bill oh, Murray okay, movie. Okay, Don't quote me on that one. That's a Bill Murray for sure. So the woman lives upstairs, uh-huh. the hard lock bars in the middle, uh-huh. and then the sex dungeon they use together is downstairs. Right. Horrifying. Upstairs, downstairs. What a horrifying sandwich. <laughs> um, <laughs> horrifying sandwich. Write that down. Too. They, they learned that um, the two were making plans to add a third woman into the relationship. They also learned that Bob was planning to purchase a house for this woman. Karen, how how come you can't be sex positive? I'm trying my best. <laughs> I'm just an old, old, old prune. Um, okay. So then Bob refuses to p- comment publicly on this affair, on the sexual behavior, on anything. Yeah. But he does say that he and his wife had an open marriage and that these behaviors had nothing to do with Jane's murder. Bull. A shit. A bullshit. A bullshit. Yeah. A bullshit. On February 8th, um, 2012 still 2012, probably because of Joe's confession combined with this new scandalous information, um, police searched the, the Bashara home again for, for evidence. And they find in the garage hair samples and blood, um, in the area that Joe Gens noted in his confession, Ooh. they basically just go to his confession and pull up a bunch of samples oh, and send it all in to the lab for tests. Bob's defense attorney, guy I talked about before, then hires a retired FBI agent Mm-mm. so that the defense can conduct their own investigation. Oh, no, we found that he's innocent completely <laughs> and <laughs> hates being kicked in the balls. Yes, exactly. He's Bull. never, these hair fibers prove that yeah. he doesn't like oh, to get kicked in the balls. we believe you. Um, the defense team notes that the second search of the Bashara home could be tainted because so many people had walked through in between the first and second Mm -hmm. search. Um, around this same time, the police find and impound a Cadillac from St. Clair Shores, a St. Clair Shores parking lot where Joe Gantz had been driving it and Bob Bashara was registered, the registered owner. So... 
Link, on, link on, of them together. Yeah. Now they're together. And and basically, it's like the guy that everyone's trying to say is not that smart right. or crazy or whatever. Everything he was saying. I'm sure is they true. made some dumb like sh- they're shackled together in like the Sydney Confidential episode. Yeah. Oh yes. They're shackled together. The yeah. the, the puns I'm sure oh. were a flowing. Um, so on March 1st, the lab results finally come back, and the blood sample taken from the Bashara's garage is Jane Bashara's blood. Mm. Um, the next day, Joe Gens is arrested and charged with first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. And the conspiracy charge indicates someone else is involved, right. but there's no hard evidence linking Bob Bashara, so he remains free. Um, March 9th, authorities report that the clothing that Jane had been wearing the day of her murder was missing. And it's believed that the clothing had been released to the funeral home that handled Jane's funeral. The clothes may have been mistakenly thrown away. Wait, wait, wait. wait. The clothing she was wearing. When she was found. Yes. When she, the, her body got sent to the funeral home. Yes. Everything's gone. They throw those clothes away. Don't do not do that. No, no. Never do that. Holy but shit. Apparently that happened somehow. So all sides attorneys were mad yeah. about that missing evidence. Um, and, but then they used it against each other to try to right. invalidate each other's cases. Oh, God. In April, multiple sources report that Bob Bashara is the focus of the case. He is the is still the prime suspect. Sure. Um, but the police aren't saying anything, obviously, to the press because it's it's their true field day yeah. for the press. Yeah. A couple months later, on June 24th, Bob Bashara is arrested, but not for the murder of his wife. They get him because he tries to hire a hitman to kill Joe Gens before Joe Gens testified in his at his own murder trial. You stupid fucking idiot. But the hitman he tries to hire is an undercover oh cop. Oh my god. <laughs> Yes, and that's another part in D- D- Dudley Rich. Uh-huh. Um, those nine one one tapes are oh. hilarious. The accents, those like Midwest Michigan accents, and oh they're my. like, "Oh yeah, you know." So you gotta, yeah, I, I just We're need this get guy so dead. So much hate mail from um, <laughs> people from Michigan. Right? Look, now. <laughs> don't watch, listen. watch. Don't it. listen. Don't listen. But this really happened. It's on tape. It's it's pretty crazy. And the all just the idea, it's like. Are you just going to kill the world? Yeah. Like, what is your solution? You're always going to get caught. It's Sir. because when people, you have to have some fucking humility and think you're kind of stupid and yes. like have a little bit of low self-esteem and be like, I'm stupid and everyone thinks so. Just a, just a half a teaspoon. Half a teaspoon. It's healthy. It makes you not do shit. It keeps you grounded. Right. It keeps you like low key. Like having to build up your self-esteem because you have low self-esteem makes you not a fucking asshole who thinks you can get away with anything. That's right. Right. And also what... Like the idea that suddenly there was someone there right. available. Oh, get, get another person who's a fucking, who's happy to be a hitman. Yeah. Like Is that it, doesn't make him suspicious. It, 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 sir, think it through. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, if things seem uh, uh, like a little too fateful, yeah, it's yeah. because it's an undercover cop. Right people in general <laughs> everyone's an undercover cop. everyone is <laughs> trailing you just assume <laughs> that they're all undercover they cops. put a gps thing underneath your car right be aware be paranoid okay so <laughs> bob pleads guilty but he admits admits he did attempt to have gents killed but he says it was not in an effort to keep gents quiet no 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 it was a revenge killing okay. for the murder of his wife you're so brave he, he was so livid okay. um either way bob is sentenced to six to 20 years in prison okay while in prison, Bob exhibits a series of strange and aggressive behaviors um, and routinely gets himself into trouble. He tracks up violations for hiding or hoarding his medication. Hmm. He also is gets in trouble for lying, which apparently is a big deal in jail. Really? I don't know. Liar, liar, pants um, on fire. <laughs> he gets in trouble for talking when he's not supposed to okay. and using profane language. I'd be fucked like in prison. <laughs> I, dude. Also, what is this prison? It's like, <laughs> it's it, like a it's kindergarten a convent prison. So December of that year, 2012, uh-huh. Joe Gens pleads guilty to second degree murder for his part in Jane Bashar's death. Oh. And he's sentenced to a minimum of 17 years in prison. That's not long enough. It really isn't. Um, None of it is. It's all no. such a disgrace. Yeah. And his for chil- Jane Bashar. Her children have to live with this. Yes. It's for more than 17 fucking years. That's right. 
So, um, but the good part is because of all the information that gets disclosed during Joe Gens's trial, Bob Bashara is once again implicated um, for the murder of his wife. But this time they have much more like stronger yeah, yeah. evidence that actually sticks. So on May 1st, 2013, after more than a year after Jane's death, Bob is arraigned on first degree murder, a conspiracy to commit murder, solicitation to commit murder, mm. witness intimidation and obstruction of justice charges for his part in his wife's murder. Ya yeah, dick. Ya yeah, dick. Um, during Bob's trial for Jane's murder, it's revealed that he was ex- um, experiencing marital and financial problems leading up to her death. And um, several of Bob's mistresses testified in court against him. Several. Now, you should see this guy. He This, this guy looks like uh, Tony Soprano's older cousin that let himself go. Oh, my vey. It's not... A, it's, a again, slug. that thing where you're just like... Is it his confidence? It is. Is it his his idea that he thinks? Let me see him. Steven's got a photo. Oh, oh yeah. Absolutely not. No. Would not touch that dick. Um, <laughs> or kick it hard. <laughs> That's all he wants you to do. Yeah. Okay. So they, his, his mistresses testify against him, including, um, the one he was buying the house for, um, saying that Jane had found out about the affairs weeks before the murder. And, um, basically that they provide the motive. Suddenly it's all very clear what he was them. doing and why. Yeah. Um, so on December 18th, 2014, Bob Bashar is found guilty on all charges for murdering his wife. And on January 15th, 2015 he's sentenced to life in prison um now what's odd is joe gents in december of 2015 recants his statement what? that bob was involved with his murder and claims that he was coerced by police to sign the affidavit stating bob's involvement what? yes which is very odd um because basically his initial testimony is what brought all the evidence that proved he was involved. Yeah, it that you can't take that away once it's proven. No, it's very strange. Okay. So but then Bob files for retrial saying that um that his legal team from 2014 was ill-equipped and mishandled the case, but it all gets denied and he remains in prison um under a life sentence. And if you watch Deadly Rich, there's this really amazing part. The woman who was the judge in his, in that trial, uh-huh. um, is, has none of it and is super, like they talk about, she actually is there talking about how she could tell that Bob Bashar did not like that a woman <gasps> was there deciding his fate. Yeah. He was very angry and very combative Ugh. and very weird with her. And you, but, and she is the biggest badass. You have to watch it because she's so cool. Oh my God. Um, but essentially, uh, his, all his requests are denied and he remains in pr- prison under a life sentence. Um, basically for having his wife killed. And that is the very tragic murder of Jane Bashara. Holy shit. Nuts, right? And then what about Casey Anthony? What happened? And she <laughs> went ahead and now she's hosting her own Fox game show. Oh my God. I have never heard of that. What a dick. Yeah. Just so gross. Yeah. Just so gross. Yeah. And weird. And also, you know, you can you can be super into S and M and not kill anybody. Just break up with each other. Yeah. Like what? A, oh, that makes me so sad to think of like being in a marriage and not knowing all of these things about my life essentially that are happening. You know, it's happening. Yeah, it's so unfair. Well, and also I think he, you know, because he had those financial problems, is that kind of thing where it's like this was going to be a murder of convenience, Solu- a solution to. A problem that you made. Yeah. A solution to like nine problems that you made. Yeah. And it's also poor. It's like borderline Coen brothers. How badly he did it. How badly he planned it. Because he was so cocky that he thought whatever dumbass fucking plan he made was going to work. Well, and that that he was pulling in people, not professionals. But like he basically was pulling like the cheapest person he could find. It's just all dirty and awful. I hate him. Yes. The end. The end. <laughs> <laughs> Let's fucking hooray this shit. Do it. Mine is hotel chicken strips. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I wanted you to go first, so I could think of something else. But I have to say, <laughs> these travels we've been doing, being able to order off the kids menu in a hotel and just get fucking chicken strips. Yes. Is really comforting to me. Mine was going to be the Shangri-La Hotel in Toronto. That's right. Which is the nicest hotel 
I've ever stayed at had the best customer service, like in a way where it almost didn't make sense. They were anticipating yeah. what you needed and giving it to and you. You're like, leave me like, alone. I'm not stealing anything. Oh my God. What are you accusing me of? <laughs> and there's like, no, we're just really good at yeah. being a hotel. I had chicken strips twice there. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> Off the kids menu. Yes, I fucking did. <laughs> Uh, no, that was I. I support that. Fucking it's like hooray. a comforting thing. Like after a crazy show, it's bananas. You come back to the hotel room. You don't want to. You don't want to. Like you want to order food. I go to the kids menu. I order chicken strips. It's a dream. It's a dream. It's a dream. Well, the reason I made you do chicken strips first is because <laughs> I wanted to talk about, uh -huh. and it's a thing that we actually talked about at one of the live shows, but it won't go up. This, this will be up before that. Yeah. Um, is the uh, death of Brody Stevens, who is a, a really legendary stand-up comic here in LA. Um, he's also been in a lot of movies and he has a very long resume. You can look him up on IMDb. He's been in everything. Um, but he's... He was also just one of those people like a lot of, uh, I knew him pretty well. Um, but a lot of people, he was one of those comics that did three shows a night every night. So lots and lots of comics. He was like a, a, a part of everyone's life. He was like a, a standard. He was just around. Yeah. Um, but he really, really suffered with his mental illness and, and he did it the thing. Um, there's actually a show that they made that was on HBO and Comedy Central called Enjoy It with Brody Stevens. And it is a brilliantly made show. Zach Galifianakis and Mike Gibbons were the EPs. Um, Joe Wagner and Tom Sharp were the writers. Um, I did a little thing for it in episode 12, but it was, it was an amazing television show about a comic who has ment mental illness and deals with it and is trying to deal with it. And it, it's such a tragedy. Um, if you are dealing with your mental illness and you feel lost and you feel alone, please reach out. And there are tons of, um, we will post, um, a, a great place to reach out to and put it out there. But hopefully one of the, one of the things about this community that has grown up around this podcast is the freedom people feel to talk about mental illness and mental health mm -hmm. um, and the importance of it. Yeah. And it really is important. And uh, Brody Stevens, the idea that he's not here anymore is, is just leaves a hollow feeling. It's just, it's the strangest worst feeling. And the idea that he felt alone and he felt that he was at the end of his rope that way is fucking awful. And I just would really urge you, if you are even close to any of those feelings, please, please, please reach out yeah. um, and get help and get real help and let people tell you how to manage your mental illness and your mental health because you can't see it from the inside mm -mm. and and it is a huge struggle and so, and these days you know because so many people don't have benefits with their jobs and there isn't the support that there should be um it's really hard but people want to help you yeah so please remember that and please in the spirit of brody stevens who would constantly on stage talk about Po positive push and mm -hmm. um, going for it. He just always seemed like he was actively working yeah. um, to be positive. I ironically, um, our <laughs> oh, joke of the show. Yeah. I mean, that nice. really, it's yeah. what, it's what he really was like. So, and, you know, watch all his comedy because he also was uh, a, an incredibly mm. individual voice. He really was doing his own comedy all the time and he was hilarious and he knew how funny he was. He also didn't understand how funny he was, but his, his material and his act, it was the celebration of himself. It was incredible. It was the best. And it's it, always a joy to see him on a lineup. You'd walk in and be like, this is going to fucking blow me away. Yeah. And he, he was so vulnerable too. Yes. And it, I mean, it's so, it's just, yeah, it's so sad. When he, when I worked on Late World with Zach, which was the second staff writing job I ever had, and it was Zach, had, Zach Galifianakis had a talk show on VH1 before the hangover fame mm -hmm. came. And, uh, a lot of the people I just named worked on that show and Brody was the warm up guy and we would make sure that we got all our stuff done so that we could get wow. over there for the beginning of the taping, which you really don't do yeah. most of the time as writers. The warm up guys are very, uh, it's a very noble and lonely job <laughs> that they have to warm that audience yeah. up by themselves and they do it. Brody was 
the warm up guy for one of the worst audiences <laughs> consistently, like people nodding out on heroin. Oh my god! They because it was a paid audience. Yeah, and paid audiences are the worst because they're only there for the money. A lot sure. of times they don't speak English. They're like, they're um, tourists that have come in yeah. and then they're like, oh, do you want to go see a TV show? You could make 50 bucks Jesus. or get a free lunch. So it was Brody busting ass to make people laugh. There would be like five comedy nerds in the audience yeah. and then 45 people who were like, I kind of don't want to be here yeah. or am not here. And he... The every, you know, I'm from Reseda. I have headshots. I mean, like he just <laughs> gave it to those people for two full hours and we would just go watch him and cry laughing. What's so sad is that the, when you have this mental illness and this issue, you, you know, it's the whole thing of like people call people saying incorrectly that suicide is selfish when it's not you think you're doing everyone a favor yes and you're not because people are mourning you we want you there think of it in a way that like get better so you can someday tell other people who are in the position you're in right now that it does get better and there is help and like i think you said before that anxiety is a liar yeah it, it, whatever your brain is telling you that you should you don't deserve to be here. You should be gone. It's, it's a lie. That's a fucking lie. It's a fucking lie. And you do. And your depression and your anxiety and your mental illness makes you interesting and who you are and a good person. And meds aren't going to get rid of that. Right. They're never going to. Well, and you, that is another thing that I said the first time I, the night it happened and I just kind of said something weird because it was so shocking to yeah, me that we I just, Detroit. I just wanted to say something, but. But it really is true that this idea, we're not all trying to become perfect. That's no, no, no one should want that at all. And comparing yeah. yourself to like the way you think people live, that's, that's also a lie. What's f most fascinating is being your true fucked up vulnerable self, mm -hmm. which is why good comics are good and bad comics are bad mm -hmm. because good comics stand on stage and go, here's me and all my weird, hairy, sweaty truth. Mm -hmm. And people go, Oh my God, I'm hairy and sweaty too. Thank yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. And if you go up there going, I'm, I'm perfect. And listen to my ideas. Everyone in the audience goes, I feel terrible and I don't want to watch this. Right. And that's Brody was the embodiment of that. I'll tell you all the things that are going on with me and yell and positive push. And we're going to like, we're going to have the best time. And it's like, it's rare. A lot of people uh -huh. don't get that about comedy. And that's, that's why he's going to be so missed is that voice he he did more than I think he even understood he did. Uh, obviously, yeah, a hundred percent. I'm really sorry. Oh, for, thank you. I mean, I'm sorry too. Yeah. I'm I couldn't be more sorry. It's a huge loss. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I didn't go second with fucking chicken strips. I know that's what I was trying to give you the old like, eye no, signal no. of like mm, chicken strips. <laughs> you go ahead with your <laughs> dumbass chicken strips. No, it's but funny. but chicken strips, I feel like we I couldn't be more grateful actively about this life that this Ugh. this conversation that we get to have yeah. has given us because truly it's my dream to eat chicken strips in a fancy hotel room it's my true dream yeah and my dream is coming true we really have a very lucky happy incredible ridiculous life yeah. that i'm so grateful for and that i three years in can't wrap my head around yeah it's a it's a lot it's real um there's a lot of whiplash because yeah. it's very different it's very different than my life before it's like yeah. it, chicken strips in a hotel room was a distant fucking dream yeah. for me well, only two years ago being able to talk and listening to you talk about mental health to people who need it and don't need it or have friends and don't you know i feel very lucky that we get to do that yeah yeah it's important Yep. Thanks, you guys. We really appreciate you. Yes, we 100% do. And we will post um, good outreach numbers right away. Yep. Um, because we don't want to just say stuff like that. Um, we really want people yeah. to be able to reach out. Twitter, my fave murder and Instagram, my favorite murder. We'll post the, uh, the numbers on there. Also, apparently there's somebody on YouTube that's playing Red Dead Redemption <laughs> 2 and using our logo. <laughs> And it's all in Spanish. All of it is probably my favorite thing that's ever happened. It's our channel. It's, don't worry. Our, it's our channel. Uh, we have hired a guy to play Red Dead Redemption 2. 24-7. <laughs> with our logo. And we'd love for you to watch it. It's really good Thanks, for you. guys. <laughs> Stay sexy. And don't get murdered. Goodbye. Goodbye. Elvis, you want a cookie? <laughs>